Okay, uh, welcome everybody this afternoon here in Lausanne for this uh, very special event associated to the uh, Bernie J. Holder SICAM Prize that uh, uh, we as SICAM uh, deliver uh, regularly, periodically. Um, we have uh, decided this time to organize an event where we will have the award ceremony, but then also afterwards we will have a mini symposium about science, about opportunities and challenges in, in soft matter simulation, which I think it's uh, an area that is keen to the uh, awardee of uh, this uh, edition. And I really hope that this is a very engaging scientific event for all of us. Um, there is only one minor change in the program. You will have seen that uh, after the award, we will make a small uh, break. And in the initially, in the program, we had invited four speakers. Unfortunately, due to a last minute personal problem, Manuela Delgado is not uh, able to, to join, but uh, we will still hold the uh, event with the other speakers with Jean Francois Joanny, Christophe Delago, and Matthew Tura. Um, this is a hybrid event. So we have the attendees uh, that are not present here in the room. Uh, again, for those who are not here, uh, you are also an integral part of this scientific uh, meeting, and you can ask questions uh, through the chat. I will come back later, but I mean, there will be the lecture by, by Kurt Kramer. You can ask questions and then we will relay them to the speakers during the Q&A, so that then we have both the input from the people here in the room and the people who are following us uh, remotely. So uh, without any further ado, I now let's move on to the first part of the award ceremony. And this ceremony, uh, this part of the event will be chaired by the SICAM president, Rudolf Bilumia. So Rudolf, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ignacio. I'm very glad to be here uh, really to chair this award ceremony for Kurt Kramer uh, for the Bernie Alder SICAM Prize. So the, uh, just a, a few words on the uh, Bernie Alder SICAM Prize. It recognizes the exceptional contribution to the field of simulation and modeling of matter. And in particular, is would say the most recognized uh, uh, prize in Europe uh, for computer simulation in the field that we cover from quantum matter physics to chemistry, statistical physics, uh, physical chemistry, and also biology. It's really, really here. Um, it was named in 1999 in recognition of the pioneer role of, of uh, Bernie Alder, not only its pioneer role in science, but also in making the connections between US and Europe, which is also the historical uh, role of CCAM. And I think it's interesting to uh, uh, go through the list of uh, uh, awardees. So since 1999, the award has been given a, a, every three years. And uh, the first one was awarded to Giovanni Cicotti and then Kurt Binder, that's a few weeks ago, Mike Klein, Dan Frenkel, then Michele Painello and Roberto Carr together. Herman Bernsen and uh, Jean-Pierre Hansen together, uh, David Severley and Hardy Grove together. Then the last uh, award D uh, was Saro uh, Sushi. And I think it is fair to, uh, to say that this is would not have been complete. Um, I didn't know uh, Kurt to, to, to that list. And just a few words about uh, um, Kurt. Kurt Kramer is currently the director of the Max Planck Institute in Mainz, the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research. Um, but of course, much before that, you did your PhD in Cologne in uh, 83 and uh, with Kurt Binder. And if I believe I was told that you were the first uh, with Kurt to do polymer science. Uh, and so you, you really pioneered that, that field. And then you uh, uh, went to Yiddish with some time also in Nixon in, uh, in the US. Um, you did your habilitation in, in Mainz and then become a Max Planck director in a uh, uh, polymer research center in uh, 95. So Kurt Kramer's main research as we hear is on the biological and synthetic macromolecules um, poly from polymers, the polyelectrolytes, gels, membranes, uh, liquid crystals, and, and so on. We'll hear more about it in the afternoon. And you focus uh, on, on structural process uh, and property relations, also the dynamics and, and the morphology, but of, of course we are we'll hear more soon. Uh, Kurt Kramer has been uh, has received uh, already awards from the German Physical Society, from the American Physical Society, and, and, and also you have had many students and postdocs uh, become distinguished uh, scientists themselves. 
And I could not uh, 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 finish uh, without saying a few words also about your involvement in CCAP. Uh, you are quite uh, uh, representative for, for the member for the, uh, for the Max Planck Society um, and, and, and a member of council uh, since I uh, uh, appeared in council a few years ago. I always enjoyed your, our discussions uh, uh, here in the room, but also at coffees and, and uh, later on. Um, but not only that, but you also organize and participate to many of CCAM activities. And, and I would say what's also important for, uh, I would think is that not only you did, but also now your former postdocs, uh, your former students uh, become distinguished scientists. As I said, they also participate a lot to CCAM and help build CCAM, CCAM structure and so on. So I think this is really old school that you created in, in the field and in the field in CCAM. Um, so, the tradition is that um, the uh, previous awardee, Saro Suchi, will deliver the prize to uh, uh, Kurt. So let me first congratulate you, but and, and without further ado, indeed, call Saro to deliver the prize. Saro. Okay, so it is, of course, my great pleasure and an honor alike to hand over the Bernie Enterprise to my friend and colleague Kurt Kramer. Uh, I am not used to read from the text, uh, the repetition do that, but the text is so good that I cannot, uh, cannot do better. Eventually, we'll have some comments. So, Kurt has made exceptional contribution to the microscopic simulation of polymers, as we know, setting the standards for using numerical simulation to probe conceptual issues in polymer physics and establishing it as an indispensable tool in material science. His work has played a pivotal role to establish numerical simulation of polymers as a tool on an equal footing with experiment theory, and I would add, maybe even ahead of experiment theory sometimes. Kurt has excelled in the game that we all play, namely develop and exploit minimal computational models that retain the essential properties of the physical system, and again, I would add, relinquish the in, in irrelevant or unnecessary retail, which most of the time consume a lot of uh, compute power, needlessly, so to say. So this is an art that Kurt has been playing <laughs> all along. He developed the two most widely used model for computer simulation of generic polymer properties, the kramer grenst uh, bit spring model and the bond fluctuation model. These versatile models have proven extremely valuable in the investigation of static and dynamic properties of polymers and to, to obtain insights into their emergent properties at the mesoscale. He also developed multi-scale methods, in particular with that your adaptive molecular dynamics. I'm very jealous of that because when I saw the first paper, this is not in the text. I thought, I felt compelled to adapt this to lattice boson, which we never did, but never too late. Maybe we think about that. And, and Pierre pioneered the application of systematic coarse graining and back mapping techniques for the quantitative prediction of soft matter material properties, as well as establishing them as a quantitative tool in polymer physics and material science with direct industrial relevance. These multi-scale methods have evolved far beyond the computational aspects of the framework to explore innovative theoretical concepts in statistical mechanics. Kurt Kramer's remarkable combination of intuition, technical expertise, creativity, and vision has led to fundamental new insights into the behavior of soft matter, with contribution extending, among others, to the investigation of polymer networks, polymer rheology, polyelectrolytes, membranes, and organic semiconductors. I would say that that's good enough. So congratulations again, Kurt. Congratulations and well, well deserved. Well, thank you very much. I feel extremely honored. I actually, I must say, I don't know what to say after, after this list of things uh, which, which are exaggerating. But uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope that uh, I can continue for some time at least uh, to do new things with young, new people, um, young people. And, uh, and I'm very grateful to everybody who joined me on that wave last 
was almost 40 years or 40 years. And uh, I, I benefited a lot from that, from the colleagues, student colleagues and friends. Thank you very much to everybody. I feel extremely honored. <laughs> I can, yes, yes. Congratulations again, and uh, so now we we'll listen to uh, Kurt's presentation, and at the end we we'll have some time for a few questions and interaction with the, the public, uh, also uh, uh, online. And, sure. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, as I said, I really do not know uh, what to say. I'm, I'm extremely grateful to everybody was involved in this and also to the people who uh, uh, joined me and uh, the chance and the luck to work with over many years. Uh, I would like to give a kind of uh, overview, to a certain extent, overview of things which have been done, and then at the end also come to some more uh, uh, recent uh, activities. I, I start with this picture because that's the way I remember Bernie Alder uh, from many discussions also here, but also at other places. And I always very much enjoyed talking to him. He was very open-minded and, and had many ideas and, and asked the right questions. So it was always a lot of fun uh, to, to talk to him and discuss science with him. Over years, so this is now the, the kind of topics I would like to talk about. Uh, polymers, can I see this pointer there? Ah, yeah, I can see it there as well. So <clears throat> uh, I will try to look a little, or to, to cover some ground, but also mostly give an impression of ideas and concepts which we have used over the years in order to achieve what we would like to achieve. And this, of course, is not possible at all <clears throat> without many, many interactions with people. And here's a list of people uh, who are involved in publications over the last yeah, almost 40 years. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see a current group picture or department picture, I would say, of a theory department from an out group outing at, at saint in, in Dalsas. And uh, it's not that I'm working with all these people. My personal group within that department is very small, about three people or so. Uh, but but the, the atmosphere of the group, the discussions and, and challenging each other about what you do and so on I've, is, is extremely helpful. And uh, I benefited a lot from that as well. And uh, there's one other person I would like to mention here because without him, I would not be here. Uh, and he would be very happy if he could have been here. So he. He talked about this and he congratulated me uh, for the prize before he passed, sadly, uh, uh, sadly passed away a few weeks ago. And uh, he would very much have loved to be here and uh, to participate in, in this event. Okay, uh, what does soft matter mean? Or what is my point of view of soft matter? Well, soft means that you have, typically you have large molecules, whatever these are, that can be change molecules, but chain molecules, but then can also be a completely different kind of systems. You typically have a, I still have to train a little bit with this laser pointer. Uh, you have a, typically you have a low energy density, cohesive energy density. Uh, you have a, uh, I think it's the same point. <laughs> uh, you have characteristic nanoscopic length scales. And that means you have large infra, typically intramolecular, entropy, and that means nothing else that the, uh, the thermal energy KT uh, is relevant and that de determines the energy and also the length scale of the system. And that makes it very special and also very interesting 
and uh, also challenging for, for theory. So what does that mean? Well, KT is for relevant energy scale, and you all know that this is a small energy, only four times 20, 10 to the minus 21 Joule. And if you compare this to other energies, which play a role in, in, in morphology development or in, 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 in soft matter, on the one hand, of course, you have a chemical bond, and that's about 80 KT at room temperature. So if you do not have any catalyzing environment, nothing happens. That is stable forever, which is one of the problems we have uh, nowadays, of course. And the typical hydrogen bond is somewhere between 4 and 10 KT. It depends a little bit on the dielectric environment. And that also means that this defines kind of a typical time scale also for biological systems. No? Biology is very much influenced and dominated by hydrogen bonds, supramolecular chemistry aspects. And there, uh, that means you, the typical time scales related to this energy scale uh, are the time scales we have in biology as well. And um, so soft matter means that the thermal energy dominates uh, the properties. And that means from a modeling point of view that one has to deal with different length scales. One has to know what is going on microscopically to set the scale, so to speak, but one has also to be able to cover and capture fluctuations on larger scales and really combine that uh, together. Or in other terms, you on the one hand have local uh, chemical properties uh, with an energy dominance, local bond angles, and so on and so on. And then you have a more global scaling behavior of nanostructures, that means where the entropy plays the role. And this interplay makes, makes these systems so, so interesting. And you can take a kind of very uh, naive view on, on essentially on the gens end to zero limit, saying that polymer chains, if they are long enough, uh, are independent of chemistry, behave the same in the global extension and so on. If you look here at this piece of polycarbonate, no, oops, well, no I have to see this. So, if you look here at this piece of polycarbonate of, or at this uh, intrinsically dissolved protein, if you don't look that closely, they look fairly similar. Uh, and there, of course, there's a deep formal proof uh, that this similarity makes sense, and I don't want to go into the details. So what would I like to cover uh, today? I will mostly talk about this interplay of, of uh, chemical aspects and physical aspects, but I also will say a little bit about processes. And at the end, I will mention these new directions concerning machine learning uh, or data-driven techniques, even though we are just starting to get involved in that. And I'm very happy that in, in the group in Mainz now as a, a, a young group leader, and she is an applied mathematician, she knows infinitely more about that than me. Uh, and this is important in this context. So when you do this multi-scale modeling or linking of the, of the length scale, there are different ways of doing that. You can do this either sequentially, so you start out from atomistic detail and then systematically coarse grain, or you can do the top-down approach, uh, start from a kind of model, for instance, for a mesogen or so, and then uh, reintroduce chemical details. Or what you can do is you can say, oh, somewhere I need local details, but somewhere not, and I try to couple these different systems, that is the adaptive resolution simulation approach. And I will first talk about this first part and go back actually some years ago. So what you do there is you typically uh, start with, a, with a atomistic coordinates and you group atoms together to coarse grain monomers. And then you map atomistic degree positions onto a coarse grain degrees. And there are many different ways of doing that. So uh, we typically, we started many years ago with structure-based methods. There are also force-based method, methods, which are actually closely related if you go into the theory. Uh, or, and, or potential or, uh, based methods, and there are different ways to calculate then these different interactions. I don't want to go into the details here. I think that, that would be a rather technical talk. So what you have is you start out with an atomistic description and you map this onto a simpler bead string type of, of model as it is done here for the standard polycarbonate. And what you then do is, you start out with this one, you map it onto this one, you equilibrate such a system, run such a coarse grain simulation. And then what I think is very important that you're able to go back to reintroduce the details. And then you can check in comparison to detailed experiments to what extent do I really cover and then reproduce the details of a system. And that means also certain properties of the system. And uh, one thing we were very proud of at the time, many years ago, that by this uh, simulation of a coarse grain model, in the case of polycarbonates, so the standard materials here for glasses, of CT materials, and so on, um, we found that the typical radius of gyration squared, so the extension of a chain essentially, divided by the chain length n for polycarbonates is about 37 angstrom squared. So that is not an important number. However, what was important is 
that we got this before the neutrons get us. Maybe a few months later, Dieter Richter, you know him very well, uh, came with a, with a neutron scattering experiment and got the same number. So that was uh, one of the first uh, instances where we with simulations were a little bit ahead, a little bit only, but we were ahead of, of, the, of the experimental colleagues. And, um, and that was our aspect. And the other aspect compared to all atom simulations at the time when we compared this, these core squared simulations uh, gave, gave an enormous speed up, which was very important there as well. When you now start with this and go back and reintroduce the chemical details, you can then look by only by local rearrangement, equilibrate such a melt, and then you can directly compare to experiment. And what you see here are two neutron scattering experiments, one of a fully deuterated and one of a fully protonated polycarbonate. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the uh, what you see here is with the lines is the simulation and uh, and the um, uh, symbols are different experiments and you see that we not only reproduce the general property here via morphous halo but we also reproduce this little kink here and we could actually show that this kink was an intramolecular contribution and not an in why can we show this with the simulations well when you have a simulation you can do one thing which you cannot do an experiment I can easily adjust the scattering length of any atom. No? I can make water, uh, hydrogen, extremely visible or not visible at all. It has nothing to do with real visibility in the experiment. But, then, but by this, I can select interactions and see which one shows up in the scattering plot and which one comes from there. And that, that, the game, that game we played there at that time and, and were able by this to, to identify this, this peak as an intra chain peak in the uh, for polycarbonates. And um, and also in the first attempt to look at the dynamics, of course, we couldn't do long runs. There was no way. But for short chains, what we could do is, or what one could do is, one could uh, look at the diffusion constant of short chains and then using the Rouse model, as is written down here, so you can calculate the viscosity from the diffusion constant, radius of duration, and so on. And then you can predict the viscosity for such a melt. But we were at different temperatures than in the simulations. Uh, in the experiment. The experiments were at low temperature, 500 Kelvin was the highest they could do, and the system started to deteriorate, to burn, or whatever. But in the simulations, our lowest temperature was only 500, right? and we could go to 2000 uh, because we didn't have these problems, of course. Uh, but what we could do is we could match one temperature at 500 Kelvin experiment and simulation, so just giving a prefactor here, yeah? and then could extrapolate, so this is one over, uh, over temperature, uh, extrapolate from high temperature into low temperature from experiment, uh, from simulation and from experiment into the simulation. Now you see that we have a reasonable agreement. That means that obviously the structures one gets by this and the dynamics one gets by this is, is able to reasonably predict and uh, explain what is going on in these kind of experimental systems. And we extended this then to the question of polycarbonates and surfaces and interfaces that was important uh, actually, uh, for, for uh, CD stampers, I should say that this was done really for basic research, but in collaboration with industry at the time when Bayer in Leverkusen still had a, a research lab for soft matter or for organic materials, which doesn't exist already anymore for 30 years. Now. And, um, and depending on the chain end, and depending on the stamper material, you had either an energy dominated sticking of the chains to the surface, which was very bad, or by, by preventing this, this uh, coupling of a benzene ring to the metal surface by using these groups here, you could have an entropy dominated surface, which made it easy to, to remove a stamper from the city. That was a direct uh, result of, of, practical, of practical relevance for, in this context. You can extend this to more complicated systems. These are different polyurethanes, which was done actually with Covestro, never published because once they saw the results, they were not interested anymore. But I think it's an interesting scientific result. So you have two different variations of this polyurethane. Uh, I don't want to go into the details here. But it's, uh, what is, I think, interesting when you have this smelt here, for instance, when you can make a primitive path analysis to calculate the entanglement molecular weight of these systems. For these two different variations of polyurethanes, what we get is we get a characteristic entanglement length. And from that, we can calculate a plateau modulus. And this, I think, tells a little bit uh, uh, what kind of accuracy you can easily reach with these kind of methods. Here you have uh, a plateau modulus from the simulation of about eight 
at the nine times 10 to the five and experiment is 5.5 for this variant for P1. And here you have 1.4 times 10 to the six uh, compared to experiment. And experiments are a little bit lower, which makes sense because you always have polydispersity. And, uh, and when they, they saw that they were happy and uh, unfortunately uh, they had some details in the experiments they didn't want to publish. So it never, it never came to a publication, but I think it's still an interesting result. However, this is all nice. And, uh, and I think it's, it's a standard technique now, uh, not only developed by us, also developed by many other groups uh, in the world. The problems occur more when you look about dynamics. So this is a small piece of, poly of polystyrene. And uh, here you see this, this uh, piece in a different representation in the stick model. And the question is, how can I understand the dynamics of that chain based on such a cross grain model? And then you have a, you run into a problem. This is a very top, hot topic still, and there are many activities going on. So when you simply do this, so you take this model from before and you turn these two uh, against each other, you just use distortion. And then you find an energy landscape on the atomistic level, which looks like this. And that is what you find on this coarse grain model. You see, well, roughly it's, it's the same. However, we were not able, and I don't know whether anybody is able, to calculate from this rugged energy landscape the mapping of time scale for this rate, the, uh, model. It's just too complicated. And actually, it also depends in which direction you turn. If you go back, you have these, these spikes at a slightly different position. So it gets very, very complicated. However, what you can do is you can map short mean square displacements, as it is shown here, from uh, Yes, from, uh, from uh, all atom to united atom, you have a short runs and map them onto each other. And then you use united atom to cross grain and map them onto each other. And by that, you get a time scaling for all atom uh, simulations compared to cross grain simulations. And that for the expert says that within the simulation, uh, one tau in Leonard Jones units of a simulation. Uh, is about 400 picoseconds in the experiment. If you would do it just from the masses as you do it for helium in the simulations, typically in our systems, one tau would be one picosecond. So it's a factor of 400 in between this real mapping and this just mass-based mapping for, for the simulation. But when you do that then, you can predict without any adjusted parameter diffusion constancy, in that case of polystyrene, all the way up to 50,000 molecular weight, and these are, uh, these are data compared to experimental data by the Zalesco group at that time in Mainz using uh, a force release scattering. So you get this predictive power with these methods. And I think that is something which uh, is used at various places. Once you have this ability to map the local beat friction and you can use, uh, can work on the basis of a beat friction for polymers. This is of course only the most simple case. And it becomes much more complicated when you have a system like this. So this is a simple, fairly simple liquid crystalline system. You have an acid benzene group here, and then you have these aliphatic side chains, and these aliphatic side chains are flexible. They move around, and by that you directly go from a disordered state into a smectic state. You have no pneumatic state in between, which you typically have when you go from a disorder to liquid crystal, liquid crystal states. These flexibilities of the of these side chains make uh, make it that you get a direct jump from the disordered state, not into such a pneumatic state, but directly into, uh, <clears throat> into a smectic state. When you do that, you find the following. You have interesting uh, translocation motion, so to speak, from one layer to the other. So this is the kind of layer where we only show the other benzene group and not the aliphatic side chains. This is the, the no? so coarse grain model. What you find is you have, you have this direct translocation, we have, of course, the in-plane motion, and we have what is called the parking lot motion. You go here, you go into the interface layer, and then you go to the next one. So you have three dynamic processes which you would like to match. You would like to understand with the cross grain model. If you want to understand biological um, molecular processes, for instance, a structure formation with a, with a specific technical property, you better get this right. Otherwise, you end up with a cross grain simulation for the wrong corner of your uh, pro, uh, structure diagram. And when you now do it, take the standard simulation and do this, what you find is you find that the, uh, 
the time mapping for these different processes gives completely different mappings from the simulation time to the uh, uh, real time of this, of this process to happen. And, uh, and that means even though we have a coarse grained model which reproduces the phase diagram perfectly, correct uh, transition temperature, correct density jump, correct order parameter, these different processes get scaled up in a completely different way. And this is a very severe and, and uh, uh, problem if one wants to look at more complicated systems. And the reason in the end, as usual, is, is kind of simple, but how to repair it is a different issue. So what you do is when you look at it and you look at this again at this scheme here, and look at the, at the uh, free energy landscape as a function of position Z of a center of such a, as a benzene uh, a mesogen and the cosine theta, so this angle with respect to the uh, direct orientation on this uh, all atom description, it, it looks like this. And in the coarse grained model, you see that at this, this position here, which, which is this flat in between, there's a much higher energy. That means there's in the coarse grained level, you get the minimum of free energy, right? Which produces you all the static properties correctly, but for dynamics, you get wrong because the barriers you don't get correct. So what you have to do is you have to correct for these barriers as well. And for more complicated systems, people like, like Tristan Bureau and Joe Rosinski. Tristan is now in, in Amsterdam, in Heidelberg, and, and uh, probably in, in Jules in Berlin now. They use Markov state models where they piece by piece connect the dynamics with corrections of a free energy, and then one gets this right. But you have to identify all the processes. And this is still something which is, I think, uh, has a lot of work, especially for more complicated systems. There's a kind of fruit fly for this to check out what is going on. But these are many problems. Here you see this again more clearly. So that is this position here where the, where the mesogen is like this, that has a very, very high energy in the coarse grain model compared to the real atom model. And because of that, you get on the coarse grain level, it's completely wrong acceleration uh, uh, degrees depending on what kind of process you look at. But what I would like to do is, of course, I would like to uh, uh, accelerate in a coarse band model all processes in the same way. And this is, I think, one of, uh, of the real challenges which we have in, within the TRR 146, this uh, uh, coordinated research center of the DFG in Mainz. Many people mm -hmm. in Darmstadt in Mainz and also at our institute are working uh, on, on problems like this. Well, all this comes together. If you, if you are looking at polymer electronics, I don't want to go into any detail here, but uh, that is work of Dennis Andrienko and Costas Daulas in Mainz. Um, so where you really have these complicated systems, you start, for instance, when you have such a system, you start with a donor acceptor copolymer, you need aliphatic side chains to make it processable at all. You have to look for structure formation. So you have to have an all atom model, which describes the, which allows you to, to produce a coarse grain model. You have to equilibrate, you have to develop morphology, and eventually you have to do the step back in order to calculate uh, uh, charge transport in these systems. And this is, I think, the, more or less the ultimate art of doing that. And they are working very heavily. And uh, I must say, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm happy that I'm not that deeply involved in these problems. But it's, uh, I think it's a fascinating and very important area. Of course, there are many, many cases where uh, this very precise mapping is not so important, where you can link an atomistic description with a simpler model which reduces the, 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 the problem to the physics, but not necessarily exactly quantitatively in a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, correspondence. And an example of this is, for instance, this problem of co non solvency. So what you have here is you have polynipum, which is a very interesting polymer, which has in water a typical lower critical solution temperature. So you are at a low temperature, is water soluble, you increase the temperature, and you run into the two-phase region, which means you have a, an entropy-driven phase segregation, not an energy-driven phase segregation. And now you can sit at this point here, low concentration of polynipum in water, and then you add alcohol, but you stay at this temperature. So you add alcohol, and you see that they fall out of solution and then come back into solution. So you have two good solvents. You add two miscible, two good solvents, and the chains fall out of solution. And that is an interesting question. How can this happen? And, uh, and what is characteristic for these kind of molecules which do this is that they have a kind of amphiphilic structure. Huh? So you have a hydrophobic backbone in that case, a hydrophilic side group, and then a, a hydrophobic cap. And this is not just polynipum. There are many, many molecules or many polymers which do this. For instance, when you have uh, polystyrene and cyclohexane and, and DMF 
and, and so on and so on. This is a well-known problem and also technically an important problem. So what is going on there? How can one understand it as well? The first thing to look at is how does now the free energy change of a, of a chemical potential of a monomers change as a function of alcohol concentration? And one way to do this is, and for that we used uh, this adaptive resolution simulation method, you look at the chemical potential of your monomers of a short chain in a water alcohol mixture. And here you have a grand canonical exchange of water and alcohols and the coarse grained region, you go, you go into the uh, uh, coarse grained molecules a diffuse interview on atom region. I will explain this a little more detail later on. And there you have this interaction. And by this, you take care that you have no deviation of alcohol or water depending on the interaction. And by that, you can directly calculate the chemical potential of a monomers. And when you do this, you get a surprise. What you would expect is this kind of behavior. Huh? You would expect this kind of behavior, namely that you have a good solvent that becomes costly to get the monomers into solution. And then you have a poor solvent, a good solvent again, sorry. And what you find is the following. You find that you start with pure water and the solvent becomes better and better and better until it levels off here, but the chains collapse. And this is, uh, uh, when, when I saw this first, I thought the Bashish Mukherjee you know, did this, this calculation, there must be something wrong. You're doing something wrong. Uh, but when you look at it more closely, and I don't want to go into any detail here, what you have is, and this is a kind of general principle one can use. You have a situation that you have uh, your polymer chain in water and with a little bit of alcohol. When you add alcohol, because the polymer chain likes the alcohol much more, you see here that the alcohol is a significantly better solvent than water. Uh, it's, it tries to coordinate around the alcohol. We have NMR experiments which show this as well. And once the chain is completely decorated with the alcohol, it can expand again. And that means that uh, uh, what makes it interesting from a soft matter physics point of view, that the conformation of a chain decouples from the thermodynamic properties of a, of a solution. And this is something one can use in, in many different ways. So for instance, you can make a block copolymer of polynipum and PMPC, uh, where in one case is water is a better solvent, here alcohol is a better solvent, and depending on what kind of chain you have, you can have two minima in the conformations, you can have different structures and so on. You can play with it. You have a very versatile system of, of uh, highly stimulated responsive macromolecular uh, polymers, macromolecular systems. And you can, of course, transfer this idea also not only for a different solvents, you can transfer this also to, let's say, along the chain, when it doesn't react by simply adding something, but you can get a similar wealth of different properties. That was a collaboration with uh, Jeff Skoberstein's group at, at uh, Columbia, New York, where you have the polyacetals. Uh, which have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic part along the backbone, you can, you can then vary the length of the hydrophilic part. And it's interesting because it's also a biodegradable polymer. And then depending on the structure, you can have many different conformations and play around with that. It's again this interplay of, of having different monomers with slightly different interactions with the, with the solvent environment. So using these different uh, uh, interactions, I think one can do many different things and also interesting things. Well, this was the idea of having a sequential mapping. And I don't want to go into the details of this other step going from coarse grain to, to microscopic. Uh, that would be a, a, another a talk by itself. But in some cases, you only need interactions locally, but that, but that few you really need. And, and the original idea was, for instance, I take a coarse grain system and I have here some molecule with water. And here I don't need for water, but I have to have an equilibrium between this coarse grained regime and then the local regime, which with, uh, with the all atom structure. Or uh, so you run, let's say, a system on a coarse grained level, and something interesting is happening, and you're able to zoom in locally, but keep the equilibrium between the coarse grained and the atomistic structure. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this, this we call the adaptive resolution simulations. But there's one thing to keep in mind when you do it like this, and here you have this example of water. Of course, the water has a different equation of state than your simple coarse grain system. And that means you have, let's say, an equation of state for the atomistic, the atomistic system, you have an equation of state for the coarse grain system, and you have to have a compensation force in between so that you keep the constant density and no free energy barrier for the molecules moving forward or backward. So that you have to keep in mind. But having this in the end will allow us to, in principle, take on the coarse grain level any structure 
you would like to take. And I will show you at the end an example where we take an ideal guess. Because we had a guess has a big advantage if you know everything exactly for these kind of systems. You have very different ways of, of doing that. There's a force interpolation, that's the Hamiltonian for that system. Uh, lambda equals one is, is the whole atom regime, lambda equals zero is the coarse grained regime. And uh, <clears throat> you can either interpolate forces when you have perfect uh, map of Newton's free law, third law. However, you don't, you cannot define a thermodynamic potential. If you have an energy interpolation or potential energy interpolation, uh, you have Newton's third law only uh, uh, approximately, but you can define a thermodynamic ensemble. So it's a little bit give and take. And in most cases, we use now the potential energy interpolation, but not always. And I would like to give you a few examples of what can be done. So, so for instance, that's how you see. That's for, oh, unfortunately, that doesn't work here. This setting. Okay, what you would see is you would see that this benzene here, the buckyball goes in and out, and when it comes close to the buckyball, you uh, it assumes all detail, and you, you can study the, the structure of the benzene around the buckyball. Or here's another example of triglycine in urea water. You see the urea only here, the waters we don't show. Here you have a coarse grain system, and then it feeds in the urea and water, and you can see how the conformation of a triglycine couples to the local arrangement with the, with the urea molecules. So I have three examples where I very shortly would like to mention, uh, show you what, what we can do with, or what one can do, I would say, with these kind of, of simulations. One is what we did a few years ago with Eva Fogarty. Uh, she unfortunately went to a data company in Paris. It's a shame, to be honest. Uh, where, we, where we looked at, at, heck, uh, at egg uh, white lysozyme and egg white lysozyme in a way that we have the protein on, a, on an elastic network level, only the active center on all atom level, and then it's, that's a ligand here. And then you have here the simulation setup, a coarse grained water, all atom water, atomistic <clears throat> a protein with a ligand and elastic network. Uh, model of a protein, and that could see, then could see how when the ligand come, couples, how that couples into the fluctuations of the overall protein. And when you, when you do this, you see that this kind of simulation setup uh, reproduces perfectly with a full-blown all-atom simulation, but at, a, but at a minimal amount of computer time compared to the full-blown all-atom simulation. And that means you, you can see the fluctuations of your, of your protein, and, uh, and uh, can compare all atom and very coarse grain simulations. And uh, I think this is something where we certainly in the next uh, few years uh, try to go, go on and, and look at other systems as well. Another completely different area is uh, when you do this, of course, in principle, this kind of mapping is not restricted to typical classical uh, simulations. And one, one example we, we worked on was path integral quantum description. And what you see here, as you all know that, that is this famous uh, Feynman's path integral description of the uh, nuclear quantum degrees of freedom. So you replace the particle by a, by a harmonic chain and depending on, uh, on the quantum nature of that particle, this chain fluctuates and uh, you, have to, you need more and more beats to do that. That means then that is connected to the mass of this, the effectiveness of this particle. So what you can do is, so what you can do is in such a setting, you run, for instance, water here and run this with the standard water masses, but then you attribute for the interactions different masses to the, to the hydrogens and to the uh, <clears throat> oxygens, which here in the classical region is, is a high mass, a classical mass, so that nothing happens. And when you make this mass smaller and smaller, when you cross this transition region down to the real mass you need for a quantum description. Uh, and, uh, and also you inter interpolate with these, these interactions uh, as, as mentioned before. And that was a very nice collaboration with Mark Tuckerman and NYU at the time. And what you then see is just as an example, you have here such a water simulation, you have a classical water, the uh, water with the uh, nuclear quantum degrees of freedom and again the classical water. And you see here how this uh, uh, water looks like with the uh, nuclear degrees of freedom, you see the delocalization of the hydrogens nicely. And this also is not only graphically nice, it's also quantitatively correct. So here you have a density showing that the density is the same throughout the whole system. And what you see here is um, 
the typical size of the hydrogen uh, in the center where we have a quantum uh, degree of freedom prop uh, totally fully taken into account. And this is the classical region. So you make the mass smaller and smaller to the real hydrogen mass. And you see that we get the, the size of a <clears throat> hydrogen as one would get from a full uh, uh, path integral simulation for the whole box. So that works nicely. And you also see the same here for the oxygen, which the oxygen is, of course, much smaller. So you can couple a classical and this quantum degree of freedom system without, uh, without really uh, uh, incorporating artifacts of this, of this ansatz into the uh, quantum degree of uh, region of degrees of freedom. And then finally, I would like to say, when we started this, the idea was, I want to do some, some uh, simulation and locally, I want to look more closely. But in, in the end, it turned out, it's much more interesting to use that to do something. No? So you have a cost grain system, you can easily do some, some interesting things and you see how this couples into an atomistic system. What does it do there? What changes? What is going on? And, and one recent example is, is here. So you again, we have this atomistic region here of a liquid. Then we have a hybrid region that interpolates between the coarse grain outside regime and the atomistic regime. You have this compensation function, which is in the case of the Hamiltonian description, just the free energy difference. You can directly get the free energy difference between the systems out of it. And, and what you have here is, is an ideal guess in that case. And again, for this ideal guess, I know everything and can, I can easily be granted out. That's no problem at all. I simply, I add particles or take particles out. I have no problem doing that in an ideal guess. I have it under perfect control. And then I can, for instance, couple, uh, as, I, as we done, have done here, a low density or, or high temperature system. I don't know where's my pointer going. It's back. Uh, uh, to a high density system. And you can then look at the flow of that system. By coupling to the ideal guess, you can feed in the particles as needed so that we on the ideal guess part on both sides, the density is always correct that you see this flow. And then you can see the flow profiles as shown here uh, for a WCA, weak gentle Anderson fluid, where the result here for the flow profile nicely reproduces the analytic results. It was work done by Masia Haidari, who is now with Gerhard Hummer at VMPI for biophysics and Amin Gwanestanian in Göttingen. And then we, we can now play with different wall interactions. We can have larger molecules here and to see what is going on in this more uh, complicated setting. Well, these were two areas or two fields which where I think interesting things are going on. Looking at commodities, what I said in the beginning, is certainly something which is for many of us not so interesting anymore. However, nowadays uh, people are thinking about how to depolarize what happens there and so on and so on. It might come back again. Uh, and. Uh, but I think what is especially interesting is looking at processes because everything we have is non-equilibrium at the end. No? So we might be stuck somewhere and where we can treat it with equilibrium methods, but we have to be able to control and understand the way into that state because that's the only way to manipulate systems and to get the new systems in a controlled manner. And in this field, of course, I think data-driven methods, machine learning methods will become also more important. Uh, and I can give you here uh, one example, for instance, for simple mean square displacements of a polymer melt. Uh, when you do what is called a, a principal component analysis, it's not really machine learning, but people call it machine learning and so on. Uh, you see that in, in the case of a system where the mean square displacement essentially stays the same, and, and with a power law, you see a scatter of plot of the first and second principal component, amplitude of the first and second principal component, in such a system. And when you have a change in the power law, for instance, you see this typical horseshoe shape. That is very characteristic, which several people saw. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's coming from the dynamics of internal distances. I think it's important. I think it's interesting. But I would really like to know what can I learn from that and transport, transfer into a measurable quantity. And that we are not able so far. I think this is one of the things I want to learn physics from that, no? not just reproduce numbers or so. We have, we have a way now to produce, uh, predict the glass transition temperature. Alexandra Kukarenko is probably today presenting that at a meeting in Paris uh, from very short simulation data, asymptotically right on the spot. But we do not understand 
really the, the, the physics and do not understand so far, how can I transfer this as a quantity somebody can put in a measurement device and say that is the signal, which gives you that uh, information. And I think this is one of the, at least from my point of view, one of the real challenges for machine learning and data-driven physics, not reproduce, making a better force. This is a different issue. Uh, that is uh, getting, getting a better curve for forces and so on. I think, but the deep questions I think are kind of in the end. That gets me to the last point where I just would like to uh, make a few comments about the future. Uh, of course, one has to be very careful about future. And this I've stolen from a proposal we have written and we, we, which was evaluated and I very much hope that we get that uh, funded. Uh, for a bigger project with the university uh, as well, or the university is leading it, we have a smaller part, on, on polymer concepts in cell biology. Uh, there I think it's becoming more and more apparent that many things can only be understood if one has a better understanding of soft matter physics in the background. And there's, oops, there's this famous work of, of Frank Ulicher and Tony Hamid about uh, compartment, uh, compartments in the cells, how they, how they are formed and so on. But what are the real deep uh, uh, physics questions? And, and uh, for instance, on, on this multi-component, this is Martin Girard is, is working on in lines. What do we have? Typically, we look at, as, as a polyhypon case, we look at a polymer and two solvents. Maybe we look at two polymers and two solvents. But what do we have in the cell? We look at a, at a compartment in an environment of hundreds, thousands of components. Where I, most of them I even do not know. Is there a way to understand what is going on there beyond just description? Uh, can we do a, I'm looking at, at you especially, <laughs> can, can we do a kind of, of uh, uh, statistical physics we, uh, which, which is capable of doing that? There are ideas like this, uh, say, showing that the more components you have, the more you can stabilize certain critical the phenomena or uh, critical uh, points, but but I think there's a lot still in very very basic uh, physics to be done, and where simulation modeling and machine learning probably have will help as well. Another one is uh, what I'm also very much interested in. Or what I find very intriguing is uh, system complexity. So we were always talking about macromolecules, one kind of monomer and so on, but for uh, uh, protein, especially for instance, IDP. The first glance is a random copolymer of amino acids. But they have a function, they produce something. And, and one of the questions which, which we tried once to, to tackle in one of our mind's, uh, mind's material simulation days, which are certain uh, SACAM node events, uh, uh, what kind of what level of precision do I need? How robust is this against changes? Is there, is there, can we develop a general theoretical framework to understand? more about the robustness about of, of, of certain functions and properties. Uh, and, and again, I think without modeling in this in, in context with, with uh, data-driven methods, uh, it will be very difficult to really uh, have, have a lot of progress there. And these are, I only show this because I think sometimes I was asked a few years ago at a meeting by colleagues, uh, <clears throat> Uh, from, from Japan, you are from the MPI for polymer research. What should we do? Polymers are all. But I think there's a lot to do with them. There are extremely interesting scientific questions which are related to soft matter. And, and um, I'm uh, very optimistic that uh, uh, the young people in the field will be, will be occupied with many, many interesting questions for the next, for next decades. So what, do we, what would I like to, besides showing a little bit of what we have done, I think what I, what I would like to get across is that on the one hand, what we do is we do physics, physical chemistry of soft matter. But I think what is equally interesting is to do physics or physical chemistry by soft matter. Uh, with this special aspect we started more or less with the gen with one to zero limit saying that the polymer chain the inverse length of a polymer chain is the distance from a critical point. And because of that, you can use critical exponents, universality, and so on. I think we are at a point again, oops, we are at a point again, where, where soft matter, properly chosen, has, has the, the option to be the means of doing interesting new science. And, and this is extremely exciting from my point of view. And here are a few lists of, uh, list of a few topics. 
where where this uh, combination of different methods should really be able to, to uh, really uh, get us into many many new options and opportunities for really now interesting and and challenging science. And for this, I would like to thank again all of you for being here, all of us at the at the screens, which uh, I, I cannot see them, of course. And uh, again, I would like to thank everybody here for the prize. I feel extremely honored to be in that list of, of awardees. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kurt. Uh, so we have time for some questions, maybe in Sarum. Thank you. Thank you for the very, very rich and inspired talk. <clears throat> A question in the very beginning, you said that you want to call grain and then you want to be able to go back, which in my view it's a mission impossible because once you project, you destroy information. So how could you possibly make when you, when you go back? Uh, uh, oh, no, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, every cost planning is averaging out. And so you have an average information, but when you go back, you take one characteristic, you end up with one characteristic uh, sample or confirmation out of this collection of many uh, micro microstates. You end with one characteristic microstate out of this collection of many microstates, which produced your cost grant, uh, your cost grant model. It's, it's not it's not a one to one correspondence. Ah, so absolutely right. No, it cannot be one to one. Yeah, that, that was. Yeah. So, so I have a question regarding the uh, a technical question regarding the adaptive resolution. Uh, you always have to make a compromise. Either you you do uh, you you're switching in the forces or in the potential, and either charge makes the kind of compromise. So, what's your current thinking? What's the better way to do it? Depends what you want to do. So, for instance, when you when you want to uh, calculate. Uh, Free energy differences or so you use for potential based. And, and what you what you can do is for instance, you can use a potential based to set all the scales and get uh, information about free energy differences. And when you then want to look at dynamics, you can switch to a force based. This is not a this is not a win. But really depends on the question. So what we did, for instance, years ago with Rzezinski equation, I don't know if you know that, uh, you can uh, simply take a molecule and pull it out in the other direction. Uh, forget about the Compensation interaction, and when you the molecule feels that difference, and you can directly simulate Jarinsky, then of course you do the, the, the potential based. That's the way to do the surface based. Sure. On the co non solvency claim, but there's an actual phase transition when that constant temperature you change the composition of the solvent. Your simulation showed that polymers shrink, but is that the same as a phase transition? Um, but we didn't uh, uh, very carefully look at it, the, the limit of very long chains. But as it looks like, when you look, for instance, at, um, at the histogram of end to end distances, the initial collapse looks like a first, first order phase transition. And then this expansion seems to be a gradual change and not a phase transition. That is how it appears. Yeah, yeah. And you can, sorry, and you can, of, you can turn this around. You can take, you can take two poor solvents. But when you take two poor solvents, you do not have this effect. Then you have a competition between depletion uh, of, of these two uh, of these poor solvents with polymers, which, for instance, lead to the fact that, that PMMA swells in water alcohol. But this is a different effect. I have a question on your spectrum system where you were looking at the ocean of spectrum of as far as I know, the permeation constant in spectrum is something which is very hard to measure and people find extremely different results from the same kind of samples. Could you help fixing these kind of things with your, with your simulations or? What do you mean by fixing oh, these things? I mean, would, do you have precise predictions for this kind of, I mean, you, you would need to see, put it in a fresh gradient or something. Like no, I, I think we get, we get fairly precise from the simulations. We get fairly precise predictions for the translocation rates, for instance. Mm -hmm. And for these systems, they are much, much higher than, we, uh, than in the other simulations, the older simulations of, of um, uh, the UK group um, ever used uh, these hard ellipsoids. No? Mm -hmm. There, this barrier is almost infinity. And, and, be, and so, these flexible, these flexible pieces make it make it much easier for the for the one of us, so Mike Allen and then uh, These flexible uh, side chains make it much more uh, simple for the molecule to go like this. No? 
and then this invisible into this interlayer. So now we have to make a comment on your last thing on this, on this comment says, I kind of agree with everything you, you say, which means somehow this is a question of polymers and many, many components, and I think this is correct. However, I also have in mind that many of these stuff are out of equilibrium systems. In the of course. Sense that they consume energy. Of course. And to me, this is the main physical question to solve. Would be how does this non equilibrium behavior count compared to classical phase separation, even if you have a huge number of components? But but this but is but a picture I have in mind. But I, uh, sorry to, to contradict you at that point. I, I, completely, I completely agree. No? And of course, you consume energy, and when it dissolves, you have to get away from go for garbage. For that, you need this finite lifetime. Uh, but I, I have doubts whether one can think of it without taking into account this complicated environment, at least in some average way or so. I definitely agree with that. But if you don't take into account the active character or non equilibrium or whatever you want, of course, of course, yes, you will be out. Even if you I, have a very fancy theory, I, I completely agree. Which I agree is needed, what you said is needed, but it's not the solution to the whole matter. Uh, then, then we completely agree. Sarah, <laughs> <laughs> I think there are questions online. We have a question from Ben Shu, who starts by thanking you for this impressive talk, and then he comments on the adaptive resolution simulation that a particularly remarkable approach. As you showed, it is also very powerful for biomolecular systems. Are there specific technical impediments that have prevented its widespread use in biomolecular simulations, or are there other reasons? Uh, I think the, one of the points is that we never really, and this is something we should have done, we never really put it into a software which is widely distributed. Uh, I think that is something which is on our, on our to-do list. This is the major reason. So it's now within, within the special plus plus, it's now in and, and you can use it. The uh, preliminary version was in Romax, uh, but that was a preliminary version. I think it's the, the point why it's not that widely used. You can see that many reviews where people refer to it is that uh, we do not have a software so far uh, up to this Espresso Plus Plus where people, knowledgeable, knowledgeable people, simply can use it like Romax or something. Curiosity about the calculation that you were showing. You, you mentioned that you were coupling that with the central molecular dynamics. Yes. Is there any reason why you picked that one? I mean, compared to Tegas or? Uh, I can tell you the reason is in that case that it was a collaboration with Mark Takaman. <laughs> He's not typically a central man. That's why but he said, we, he, said that for, he said we should do it. So we, we discussed that. And, and, uh, but he thought that for that problem, that was the best way of doing it. And, and, but there are no technical limitations that would prevent you from doing. No, there's, the there's an earlier an earlier version, uh, not for water, but for model particles, where, where it was done differently. But for that case, for water, it was for satellite dynamics. Other questions? I think you have the rank sustained machine on the table. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are different things. Uh, point one, I didn't say this here, but uh, I said this in a Max Planck internal meeting uh, two days ago. Considering the energy costs <laughs> and the energy consumption of the exascale machine, first of all, we have to be very careful and be very efficient. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, th I think what for the exascale machines, we, we need new new modeling paradigm uh, because uh, these are very heterogeneous machines. And in order to really take full advantage of it, um, I think in the end we have to really combine. And in the sense I, I I described it, simulations on different scales which really directly interact with each other. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to really efficiently uh, uh, take take advantage of it. But then, for instance, what would be one of these? "Quote unquote simple things to do immediately is to look uh, to look at the whole fluctuation spectrum of a, of a huge uh, IDP with all the intermediate states, which which then have a function or so. Uh, and one can much more uh, go towards systems, take into account complex environments and so on. I think there are the major opportunities for for the exascale machines. But there is this huge barrier. Better be very efficient." 
So, so far, I don't know how it's in other countries, but in Germany, so far, when you apply for computer time in Munich, for instance, uh, in other places, uh, your computer time is based on the quality of your scientific proposal, but not of costs. Of course, there's only a finite amount, but not of, but you're not charged for the electricity. And uh, if things are not changing, I doubt whether this will go on for the next years. Let's see what comes up. It's very soon. Yeah. Uh, another question online? Yeah, we have a question from Adolf Performer. Uh, fantastic talk. While atomistic simulations are getting accelerated by GPUs architectures and targeting large scale applications, what would be the role played in this era of the multi scale simulation or cross grain phase? I'm, I'm, always, uh, I'm always a little bit uh, 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 hesitant to do two big all atom simulations. Uh, the reason is that we have typically a very nonlinear dynamics, and an all atom force field is an approximation to the real force field. And uh, if, if, you, if you do not average, no? uh, you don't have a statistical average, uh, that, can, that can easily get you in the, in the wrong direction. So I'm, I'm very careful. Uh, so, and then. And this the same happens as, uh, also is uh, relevant with respect to uh, to course based simulations. And they are also approximations, so one has to be very careful if one can do a proper average. Um, so I think we, we, if it comes to the area of extrascale computing, just uh, addressing this question, but would mean lo longer times, larger systems. But this is not what I'm really interested in. New questions are the interesting things. I can talk to both, but also in detail. Stefan, please. Um, so, I have a very important source uh, of information about polymers is, of course, neutron scattering, but also neutron is getting rarer and rarer. Uh, are you on a stage already where you can say that we need, don't need any more so many neutron scattering experiments, uh, deuterated, uh, deuterated neutron scattering experiments? Because to say the, the, the break, the break even is sort of say moving more and more towards uh, a simulation. I don't know whether Dieter Richter is listening. <laughs> <laughs> But I think for, for, for standard commodities, so if one doesn't have a problems that you have partial crystalline regions and amorphous regions and so on and so on, and so on uh, in principle, I would say that the simulations are superior to the more expensive, less expensive. I think a reactor is quite expensive. <laughs> And, and, and these kind of things you can do, and we, these kind of things you can do on your local cluster. Sounds like a good conclusion. <laughs> uh, thank you very much indeed for this inspiring talk. And, and uh, yeah, so all congratulations for thank you very much. Uh, Hello, welcome everybody back to the second part of this event uh, after having enjoyed the ceremony and the lecture by, by Kurt. We will have now this uh, mini symposium about challenges and opportunities in, in soft matter. And um, we will have these uh, three lectures. Uh, and again, I uh, remember, remind for those of you following in us remotely, you can ask your questions. You have seen it with, uh, in the previous part of the, of the event. And then Sarah will take care of relaying them to me. So the first of these speakers uh, is Jean-Francois Joanny from uh, Collège de France. Uh, he's quite knowledgeable about polymers and soft matter in general. And the, the, to the topic of the talk is about artificial beating cilia. So Jean-Francois. First, thank you Ignacio for the invitation. And I'm extremely happy that the court got this uh, very famous uh, prize. I won't talk about polymers, but I I drifted towards more biological systems. What I want, so I try to find something that was more like soft matter, but still had to do with biology. So I want to talk about beating of cilia. Uh, before I do that, I will say a few words about Kurtz. Uh, I've known him for many years. He's probably the scientist I've met, and with whom I still have contacts the further uh, 
a way. We met more than 40 years ago, and I still perfectly remember the day where we met. Uh, and that from this time, we became friends, and I always appreciated him, both as a person and as a scientist. I won't tell you my life in the course life, although there would be funny stories to say. Uh, we had a very nice period when I was in Strasbourg, where we had this uh, European lab with, that we shared between Mainz and Strasbourg, which to me was one of the nicest experiences in my scientific life. During almost 10 years, we were exchanging all the time. We were making joint group meetings between Strasbourg and and uh, minds, we essentially never published a paper together. So I, I mean, I found one, which is one of these reviews for this uh, German, uh, whatever, SFB or something like this, <laughs> of which I was a member for some reason that nobody ever understood. <laughs> it was a pretty electrolyte. Uh, but thank you for all the things we did together. And I appreciated it a lot. And I hope we can continue or even go back working together in the near future. The last one I want to say is about Corbin, whom I met through you, who was, like you, somebody who I admired a lot and who passed away recently. But let me go to Celia and Flagella. The, the first thing is that they're almost everywhere in biology. So I gave you three examples, but there will be many. The example probably that everybody knows, this is a sperm cell. And the sperm cell has a long flagella, which is made of a filament called microtube. The flagella oscillates and it pushes the cell body forward. The other place where cilia and flagella do something is they propel fluid in your body. I have two examples here. This is the airway tract. This is the surface of mucus. You have the same kind of cilia which are here. They beat and they beat in synchrony. There is a wave propagating here along this kind of brush. Of, of, uh, of flagella, and this propels the fluid nearby. This one is another example that looks like this one. In your brain, you have a region called the ventricule, which is a pocket where there's cere cerebrospinal fluid. And on the surface of this region, there are cells which are called ependymal cells. So here they are seen from the epithelial side, and you see that each of them has cilia hanging out. They beat and they propel the cerebrospinal fluid. And that's essential for many biological functions in the So there is a huge interest both for motility and for all this fluid motion in the body to understand uh, the beating of cilia and flagella. We have good models. What's well accepted is that all these motions are due to molecular motors. If you want a cilia to beat, you need a collective oscillation of the molecular motors. The simple experiment that I know was made by uh, Pascal Martin at Institut Curie, and this sketch here. So these are molecular motors. They are attached to a glass surface. They have a head which is active, which is on the top, and you put an actin filament on top of it. Now, when the motors are active, it propels the active filament, and there are very nice pictures where you see this filament moving as a snake. What they did here is they attached a pin, which is here, and they catch it with an optical tweezer which is like attaching it with a spring. So if the motors work, they pull the filament in this direction, it pulls on the bead, but then there is an increasing force due to the optical track. If the force is too big, the filaments detach, the whole stuff relaxes and the filament binds again, and it starts to oscillate. Uh, we were very proud of that. Now I show you the experiment, it's not infinitely spectacular. You have to trust me that this is active oscillations and not some more noise. <laughs> but we check that hundreds of times. Uh, of course, we have models of molecular motors to do that. The, the models that we use for this uh, to interpret that is the classical mo model of Jacques Pro and Frank Fischer, which is a two-state model of molecular motors. And that explains well the, uh, the oscillations. Uh, you can also use this model to look at the beating of cilia. So I found back all data that we did with a student called Maurice Girao. So you see a cilium beating, just applying this two-state model to elements in parallel. And if you put many, you find waves, which look like the one you had at the surface of the airway flat, for instance. So lots of things I understood, except that this theory is very complicated. 
So what I wanted, and in the language of Kurt Kremer, I would say it's not done at the right scale. It's far too molecular to use it to, to understand more global environments. So what I want to do is show you a model experiment that was done again by Pascal Martin at Institut Curie, where this time we have artificial cilia. And then I will show you the theory that we made for that, which is, which is a more coarse grained theory than the, than the theory of judicial and all, uh, where we describe the motion using things like Onzager theory between or, or linear relations between forces and forces. So the experiment that I will start, worry about is new other filaments than the microtubule, which are called actin, the one that I showed you in the previous experiment. And these actin filaments are grown on a glass surface. There are nucleators of actin. There are nucleators of actin, which are on this circle here. It nucleates filaments, and at the edge of this region that nucleates the filament, you see a brush of actin filaments that forms. These are individual filaments. And then what they do is they add molecular motors, and the molecular motors, myosins, which is a standard motor interacting with actin, it bundles the filament and the filament detached from the surface. So instead of having individual filament, you have bundles of filament like this, and the binding is due to the molecular motors. And this is not what they wanted to do. They wanted to bond on them, but they washed them, and they realized that these filaments are beating. So each of these filaments beats exactly like a cilium, except that in this case, they control most of the parameters, and they can modify the properties of the beating cilium. So this is kind of the thing that I want to explain to you. So I have a, like this picture pretty much, I, ha I have a movie, but it doesn't work showing you that all the filaments are beating. What I will show you is one of these filaments, I forgot whether it's this one or this one. They so focused on that, and I will show you the beating of this filament. So the red line is just a central line. There are many actin filaments in the bundle, and the Actin filament have a distribution of lengths that decays exponentially, so the filament becomes thinner and thinner. And you can measure that, and you have very naive models of it. So spontaneously, if you put these filaments with molecular motors, they bundle and they beat. So they, you started from something that was flat, and they beat more or less parallel to the surface. Uh, and that's not all. Uh, it changes something. There is another, this is not the first example of uh, artificial filaments. There is another experiment that was done in the group of Zunimio Joji, who is now in Santa Barbara, where he found essentially the same thing with microtubules plus motors, which are called kinesin in this case. And like the experiment at Institut Curie, they wanted to do something else, and he started beating by kind of accident, and they focused on it afterwards. This is a microtubule. The microtubule is much stiffer. Uh, and you see that the beating is a little bit different. It's more like you're used to this one as this very characteristic A shape. I can put it back. That the pattern is very different. This is due to the fact that the microtubule is much stiffer. So to reach that, you would need a huge filament that you cannot have in practice. Now, the other thing they can do, which you cannot do in usual cilia, is you can look where the molecular motors are. So biologists are very good at that. You label the molecular motors and you follow where they are. So this is the same filament as before, but this time, instead of looking at the actin, you look at the molecular motors. The filament beats. If you which here, the motors bind when it's highly curved, and then there's a wave of motors that goes to the end. It binds when it goes, to the, when the filament beats in one direction, it unbinds, and then it rebinds when the filament goes in the other direction. So there's a wave of molecular motor, and the frequency, because of this binding that can occur on both sides of the beating, is twice the frequency of the mechanical motor. Uh, so you can look at the beating of the motors, you look at the envelope, close to the base, there is nothing, and then you find binding of the motors and the wave propagates. It's a kind of constant in the of motors. So the results are, there's a special curvature where you put the molecular motors, 
there's this frequency doubling, which is kind of obvious. So it's something which is far less obvious that the wave propagation for the molecular wave, for the motor wave is twice the mechanical wave velocity. That's something which is not obvious. And the factor two is not exactly two, depending on the experiment. Okay, so that's the kind of things I want to describe. So I, will, I made some kind of sketch here. So the, the filament, I take one of these bandons, which is like this. Uh, I, I use the curvy linear abscissa as a parameter. At the point X, I have a tangent vector, and a normal vector, and the conformation I characterize with this tangent angle, which is psi. Well, this is like a semi flexible filament. So you can write the energy. The energy is just proportional to C squared. And K is the bending modulus. There are several active filaments in parallel. So the more filaments you have, you have the stiffer is the bottom. And I want to use as a variable not C, but the local angle. And the way I do that is I kind of use a trick. I know that the tangent angle is a derivative of the position, and the curvature is just a derivative of the angle. So I take these two conditions into account by adding Lagrange multipliers. And these Lagrange multipliers have a very simple meaning. This one is a torque or a torque per unit length. So this is a torque that bends the filament. And this one is a force density. <coughs> uh, and then I can write the energy as a function of these three variables, I consider them as independent and I fix the two Lagrange multipliers by imposing these two. One of the subtleties is that the bending modulus depends on the position because the filament was thicker at the base and it got thinner at the, at the tip. Typically, there is more than 1,000 active filament at the base and then it goes down to one, one you wouldn't see, so to a few when you see it. Uh, if, you, if I have the energy, I can calculate three forces. There is a force conjugate to the curvature, which is the derivative of the, of the energy with respect to curvature. AC is the elastic torque, and this lambda is the torque that I introduced with the Lagrange multiplier. There is a force conjugate to the angle. This is the torque unit length density. And there is a real force, which is conjugate to the position, which is a perpendicular force to the filament. Now, if I stop here, there is no, I don't inject energy and nothing beats. So if, even if you bend the filament, it relaxes to a straight off equation. So you need to introduce energy in the system. And the way it's done is the molecular motors that consume ATP. So the only thing I would say is that they consume ATP and there is a rate of energy consumption. Now, from there on, what I can do is follow the traditional Anzaga procedure. I write the entropy production, which is minus the derivative of the energy with the free energy with respect to time. And then I add this energy injection by the molecular motor. So if you want, I have a mechanical term and I have a chemical term. And then I can identify fluxes and forces. So I have three forces here. I have force one, which is the defense of chemical potential of the ATP reaction. I have three fluxes, which is this psi dt, x, and this rate of energy consumption. So if I want to do it in the very general case, I have to write a huge four by four matrix, which would be far too complicated. So the way we did it is we only kept the diagonal terms for the mechanical torque, and we couple the mechanical torque with the chemistry. And if you do that, here are the equations that you get. So there are three mobilities. Curvature mobility, the angle mobility, and the real hydrodynamic mobility. And there are two terms which are allowed by symmetry that engineer the system. There is no active term in this equation because I don't have any vector to check with cap on the delta. Just for the symmetry reason, this one is just a force balance, and this, the only external force is a friction on the soil. Now, Uh, you see that I have three mobilities. If I invert them, these are friction coefficients. So there's one which is one zone, which is the hydrodynamic friction, which is a friction associated to the position. So it's different if I move parallel, perpendicular and parallel to the rod. 
At this level, what I wrote is a perpendicular friction. And this you know from hydrodynamics. If you know the viscosity of the fluid around, you can calculate this coefficient. There is a there is a coefficient here associated to the angle. Now, this coefficient associated to the angle, as I will explain in a minute, the angle characterizes the shear inside the filament. So that's an internal friction between the filament when you shear them and you glide them against one another. Now, it's not pure gliding. The mechanism that creates this coefficient is what we call, call protein friction. The molecular motors bind and unbind from the filament. Where they are bound, if you shear, you stretch them. That stores elastic energy. They unbind, you dissipate this energy, and so forth and so forth. And this is way higher than any other contribution. So the contribution I have in mind here is this protein friction. There's another internal friction, which is the friction associated to the curvature. Now, if you put it on this side, this is kind of the imaginary part of the bending energy. So what I'm kind of telling you here is that this bending modulus is, is viscoelastic and there's a dissipative part in it. We know that, uh, we know that because if you take it into account, it doesn't, it's too strong and it doesn't lead to any details. So we took that out. Uh, and I have these two active forces. It turns out that the one that plays a more essential role is this one. So we gave up this one as well. So I told you about friction. Now, what is the active torque due to? Because it's in the Psi equation, so it's a torque. The molecular motors locally induce a torque, and they can rotate the filament in two dimension in one direction or the other one. So I introduced the difference in densities between motors rotating in this direction and motors rotating in the other one. And the coefficient is just a torque of a, of a single molecular motor. Now, one way to see it, so I was looking for somewhere where I could code called Kramer in here, and I found one which is here. A very nice model you can make is a model with two filaments. So you bind the motors by their tails on this side. And if the number of motors is the same on each side, even if they bind on the other side, your filament is straight. Now, these motors want to walk. If you have one motor on this side, they will walk on this filament. So this filament wants to be longer. And the only way you can make it longer if you plug them at the base here is to bend. Of course, if you put them on the other side, it bends in the other direction. Now, in this case, this one's bending in the plus direction, this one's bending in the, in the minus direction, and there is a spontaneous shear that appears locally. And if you look at the geometry, the shear or the difference in shear between zero and S is the same as the difference in angle. This is why the angle plays the role of the shear. Now, there is a subtlety with the constant psi zero here that I don't want to go into. Uh, there is a symmetry in my problem, which you see well on this picture. If I invert the two filaments, I go from this to this, and I should find the same theory. So you have to impose the symmetry. Uh, and instead of using the, if you have two filaments, instead of using O1 and O2, the density of the filament, use the difference in the sum. The sum is invariant if you exchange the two filaments, the density is changed into this uh, negative component. If you take the equation that I wrote, you have three equations. One for the angle, which is the one I discussed. There is one for the force in both directions. This is a binding of the motors that depend on the local curvature. This is the active force that depend on the density here. And there is a nonlinear term. Now, in the following, and because we tried everything and we looked at what was fitting more the experiments, uh, what I would say, I would decide that only the, the internal friction counts. So we spent a lot of time trying to estimate internal friction and external friction. <coughs> internal friction is slightly larger, uh, and it seems to reproduce much better the experiment. So we only kept this one, which means I'm going to discuss cilia, which is getting completely rid of hydrodynamics and just looking at the internal shear inside the filament. And this is the equation for the internal shear. This is the equation for the difference in densities between motors rotating like this and motors rotating like this. And then I want an equation for the total motor density. They bind, and there is a rate 
key on the dependent curvature, because I need to create this threshold over which the motors will bind. And then there is a non binding moment. And we took a very nonlinear function here where they bind above a critical threshold. So it's a kind of field function with a critical bias. So that's how we describe the beating of the filament. Uh, then you can solve these equations numerically. That's kind of easy. I can even do it myself. Uh, you have two images here. So the, the thickness is the number of filaments. The color here tells you the number of filaments that still survive at this distance. So it's very bright here and not bright at the end. So that's actin. This one is the molecular motors. So you see the molecular motors, but they bind when you go to this curvature. And there's a wave that goes here. Here they bind here, and the waves goes in the other side. So that's why the molecular motors are far away. Uh, so the frequency, as I said, it has to be twice the, free, the mechanical frequency. The wave of the molecular motors comes from the fact that I added a drift of the molecular motors. They want to walk on the filament. And this transport of the molecular motors on the filament is what creates the velocity of the wave. And it turns out that, at least in the experiment that we have, this is twice, the, 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 almost twice the viscosity of the, the velocity of the mechanical. So we have this theory. It has a already large number of parameters, but we can try to fit these parameters to the experiment. So the way we describe the experiment is the following. What you see here is the shape of the, of the bundle when it beats. Each color is a different the confirmation at different times. You see this H shape that you see with your eyes when the stuff is beating. <laughs> this is a theoretical one. That's the experimental <coughs> one. This is a theoretical one. Uh, the experimental one is slightly tilted. We could have put it back in the right direction. We just showed it the way it was originally. Uh, this is a mice intensity. So if, if there's little curvature or at the close of the base, there is no density, then there is a threshold. And then you see this peak and this peak travels. So you have a wave of motors that goes to the end. Uh, you also have a wave of motor, although the transition is less sharp in the calculation. And this is a curvature. So this is the sharp curvature and then the wave of curvature propagates on the way to the end. And on this side, you see, uh, you see the, sorry, this is curvature and this is the motor density. You see the motor wave problem. The way uh, the experimentalists like to cut their data is they, we have two ways. We have the motor waves, which is in black here. We have the curvature wave, which is in red, and they put a second curvature wave. The red is the top of the, the maximum curvature, and the blue is the minimum, is the minimum curvature. You see well on this plot that this curve is sharper, so it, it binds here, it goes to the end, then it relaxes, then it goes to the end, then it relaxes. Uh, so this is the experimental curve, so you see the period it goes very slow, it's like 10 second period. Uh, you see the ratio between the two periods, and you see the ratio between the two velocities. And here is the theoretical <coughs> calculation that corresponds to that. That's pretty much uh, what, we put in the, what we get experimentally. Uh, the, the question you might ask is why is there a velocity of the motors drifting in one direction? One idea for that would be that there is an allosteric effect, which means when you have a motor, the next motor tends to bind just behind, and that propagates a wave. So that was, that's what would create this velocity. So that's where we are with that. Uh, what I want to do is kind of summarize what I, what I told you. Uh, in these experiments, what we measure is both a beating mechanical wave and the myosin wave, or motor wave. Uh, we made a series that never referred to the molecular details. So we did this kind of mesoscopic theory which is based on its aggregation. There is a question of the role of the, of the various frictions. I should know what happens when you use only internal friction, of course, 
the, the hydrodynamic <coughs> friction is interesting because it creates flow around the beating cilium and that will help coordinate the cilia. Even if it's a weak correction, that's sufficient to coordinate the, to synchronize the motion of the inquiry cilia. Uh, I took one type of active forces. I showed you that there were two. Uh, it turned out that if you only take the other one, there's no beating. So we tried that. So the one that I took is the only one that works. Uh, and I said that the active term was proportional to the, uh, was controlling curvature. It, it controlled the angle. That also doesn't mean doesn't need to do beating. Of course, this model is very naive. So I told you it beats parallel to the plane. In fact, there's a small three-dimensional locus. So we are currently trying to, trying to redo this calculation in three dimensions. So geometry is much more complicated, but now we have equations. It's much harder to decide how to characterize the shear between filaments in two dimensions. One of the things that we are after is actin is chiral. Well, you have all reasons to believe that the beating could be chiral. But if you write the three dimensional equation, it's clear that there are chiral terms. So we haven't looked at them in detail, so the chiral terms are clear. One of the things that they want to do is synchronize cilia, which will beat one, and after some time, the neighboring one will beat with a constant phase difference. Uh, I think the only way to do it is by fluid flow. So the, the, the thing you want to do is look at the motion that I described, calculate the fluid flow, and then say it exerts a torque on the neighboring cilia. Uh, and then the, the dream of Pascal Martin, who did the experiment, is to Make self-propelled particle with this cilia, which we kind of make an artificial, uh, an artificial sperm cell that would be propagated by this, uh, by this artificial cilia. He hasn't done that at all for the moment. So that's where we are. Thank you for your attention. So we have now time for questions. Good. Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Remember a lot of the good times we had together. So, so the place where I wanted to talk to you, I didn't say it, is that this model with two filaments is like is exactly your railway track model. That's exactly that. what I wanted to ask. That's, uh, so that's so, exactly it. Except we know the springs. The springs in molecular motors. Uh, that, but that is just what I wanted to ask. Don't you need a kind of uh, length? Uh, length compressibility because otherwise any bending immediately goes to the very end. What did so, I miss that? So the, the filaments are rigid, they are not extensible. And if you want to to shift the motors that bind you, the only it thing must you propagate can, to the very end immediately. It, it, no, because because of, because of the dissipation. But if you if you have a fixed length of each filament that you bend them against each other, so that the internal distance you bend and then afterwards you bend it. Okay, so that is, that is exactly when it has to come back again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. What compensates is the other part of the yeah. weight. Okay. But it's exactly your model. Except we make it dynamics and we use the shear as a, to, to, to control. Well, so to get bending, you needed to break the symmetry between the two filaments, right? You had to put the motors on one the and then is, to walk I don't, on the other. I don't put one. I just say some of them rotate. <clears throat> some motors rotate like this, some motors rotate like this. But of course, I break the symmetry between the two, between the filament, between the one rotating in the plus direction and the one rotating in the minus direction. The theory should be invariant if I ignore it. <laughs> this is the only thing that I need, which is that if I call plus the minus and minus the plus, I get the same theory. Yes. So that discards some term, for instance, the nonlinear terms that you choose have to respect this condition. They mean the filaments, they grew from, from, from the circle of the, this initial thing. So they, they all yes. have the same orientation. So they all have the same orientation. Right. And so now then there's no difference between them. So why? Do you it's not the filaments. It's, uh, it's on which one the motors, on which one there are more motors than on the other one. That's what creates. So it's just the fluctuation. It's an excess of motors okay. locally that creates a bend. Yes. Coming to the uh, for the experiment, you say it's difficult or he hasn't managed to get this up for particle. But I get that again by because you say they, they create they nucleate these uh, filaments and then they bundle. But again, if there could be a fluctuation, it could break the symmetry and then the object so, will start. Yes, yes, and that's the part that they don't control well. They control all kind of geometries to work in filament on the flat surface. Then you would have to do it in some kind of particle. 
the nuclear effects like what you mentioned, which means that the growth itself could break the yeah. And then, of course, it's asymmetric. We expect it to be broken. Sorry. Thank you for the very nice talk. I appreciate the value of the uh, analytical or simplified model. I still think that it, it's a very suitable case for uh, multi state models in order to investigate the fluid flow around. So, if you use particles to model your filaments and give them an appropriate dynamics and then run that sub consistently with the, with the so, 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 in a sense, I agree. Now, the fluid flow, these filaments are very long and very thin. So, you can use probably slender body theory to calculate the fluid flow. If the filaments are too close, there is a new kind of the top thing. Then you can use standard body theory. There are lots of ways to do that. So that's how we would do it. Now, of course, people have done the American simulation and say, yeah, Gerhard Kamper has spent a lot of time. And say, get easy. They do all kinds of simulations, and but we haven't used that here. The, the, the multi scale simulation for the cilia itself is difficult because the molecular motors, anyway, you have to choose a model which is course correct. It's far too difficult to use. I mean, people are trying to do that, to do molecular simulations of molecular myosin motors. I don't think they do it in such a way that you can use them. So even, even the simulations, the one that they call microscopic, have a constraint model of molecular motors. We have some that we that are considered as very good, but still it doesn't have all the atom that's effects. Actin is much easier for them, although the actin protein itself is rather they replace it like by beads, for instance, or by skywall. So it's two filaments. When I call it the filament, it's two filaments that rotate against one another, which for me would be where the reality would come from. I also have another curiosity. When you talk about this, the growth of astrophy, in how these motors correlate them with the brain symmetry. Normally, I wish I could use a Normally, as you were saying, no, it's more the interaction of the motor with the asymmetry of the filament that determines how they will behave. So, I was wondering. Uh, so, so the place where this velocity is coming is on the total density of motors. So the two filament plays the same role. Now, the only thing I'm saying is if I do molecular motors, the motors bind and unbind, as I said. But if I say they bind better in the plus direction after an already bound motor, I will generate a turn. Okay. And you can make a microscopic model that gives you that. But that's then a fundamental property that even if you would now consider how motors would move along a filament, that could also then play a role in how they do. Yes. Yes, it would. I agree. But I mean, to be honest, we didn't find anything else than this to explain the difference. So we tried all kinds of things, and this is the only one that fits. There are no further comments or questions, then let's thank you, Jean Francois, again. The second speaker it will be Christoph Delago from the University of Vienna. In case he will be talking about machine learning for rare and all the type of events. So, Yes, uh, thank you, Ignacio. Uh, thank you for including me in this uh, event. It's always nice to be at SICA, but particularly nice for this occasion here uh, for the prize uh, symposium for Kurt Kremer, who is receiving the Bernie Alder uh, prize today. So Kurt is really a pioneering scientist, has done great work, and is a role model for, uh, for all of us. So I'm extremely happy to be here for this, uh, for this occasion. Now, in my, my group over the years, uh, we have done a lot of work to try to understand um, to first order phase transition. So, what's going on during freezing, melting, uh, phase separation, 
cavitation. And when you do that, <clears throat> you face a number of problems. And I would, uh, when, you, when you try to simulate these processes on a computer, you face a number of problems. And what I would like to discuss today is how you can use machine learning to address, to address these problems. So this talk will be about methods. And I feel authorized doing that because also Kuhn has in his career developed a number of very important, uh, important methods. So let me first acknowledge the people who have contributed to this uh, work. So Phil Geisler from UC Berkeley has done, uh, has contributed importantly to the things that I am going to say. And it was a shock for all of us this summer uh, when he passed away at uh, much too early at an age of 48. So Phil was really a brilliant scientist. He had a deep knowledge of statistical mechanics and made important contributions in a number of fields ranging from biophysics to nanoscience. He really understood the properties of water. He understood solvation. He made contributions to, uh, to spectroscopy. So really a great uh, scientist. At the same time, he was also a very modest and very kind person. And, uh, most importantly for me is he was a, a dear friend and I will always uh, miss him. Then uh, a large part of the work that I'm going to present was done by a uh, graduate student, Sebastian Falkner, and a postdoc, Alessandro Coretti, with some help from Salvatore Romano, who is also a doctoral student in my, my, my group. Uh, towards the end of my talk, I will, uh, I'm going to um, tell you about some uh, research we did together with uh, Peter Bollhaus and uh, his group, his student, Arjun. Uh, one, one and Gerhard Thunor, Roberto Chivina, Henry Jung, and Christian Leitert, who was a uh, student in my, my group. Now, I, I said that Kurt is a role model, and he's a role model because he's a very complete scientist. He did really groundbreaking uh, work. And when I say he's complete, I mean that he, you know, he developed, uh, it was discussed earlier, he developed models, and he is really a master in doing that. In, in, in really keeping in the model the physics that is important and throwing away uh, all the rest. So a number of models came out of his work, but he also developed methods to study these models. Uh, the method that is, uh, you know, the address method, the adaptive resolution method was mentioned, but there are a number of other methods that he developed as well. And he used these methods to study uh, to study interesting properties, interesting interesting materials ranging from polymers to, uh, to membranes, uh, organic semiconductors, dot, dot, dot. So he really is a, uh, is not a methods man just, but he develops methods, develops models, and then uses them to uh, solve interesting problems. Now, when you, when, Coarse graining was also mentioned. And I should stress that coarse graining is not just a, a way to get faster computer programs. Coarse graining is also a, a method to general, generate knowledge because it tells you which factors that uh, in your problem are important and which ones you can leave away, maybe replaced by, uh, by a random noise. And so this address method that is, is shown here is, is, is very nice because it allows you to focus your attention uh, um, in, in, in the region where details are important and model, and model the rest on a very coarse grained uh, on a very coarse grained level. So of course the questions then that you can ask depends uh, on the level of course graining and the level of course graining should be should be chosen uh, accordingly. For instance, if you look at this picture, you don't see much, just something that is kind of brown, pinkish. But you know, you cannot ask many questions uh, when you see this picture here. In this picture here, you could already guess. Well, you know, maybe this is a maybe this is a maybe this is a face. So maybe this is a face of a you know person. Looks like a man, perhaps, you know, let's say middle-aged man, but still very good looking. You can see, you can see it here. 
Uh, at this le level of re uh, resolution, you can even say, okay, he has glasses, he, he wears a, a, a shirt. Uh, so the, the, the questions that you can ask really depend on the level of resolution you can, you, can uh, you, you choose. If you would like to find out that Kurt is also a very uh, nice person, very caring person, I mean, you have to go to the next level of resolution and, and, and talk to him in, uh, in person. Now, the problems that I am going to talk about are mostly rare event problems. It is a problems that happen very rarely on the basic time scale of uh, the system, but if they happen, they happen quickly. And these types of processes, they include nucleation, biomolecular reorganizations. You find these problems in basically all areas of uh, physics, chemistry, uh, and, and, and technology. And if you try to simulate such process on a computer, you face a number of challenges. The first thing that you need to do is to select a model. You know, you need to know uh, what the forces are that act on the atoms. Then if you are not at, at temperature zero, you need to sample configurations or pathways. And so one, uh, one problem that you face is that you would like to understand how the system perhaps moves from one uh, long-lived state to uh, another, so you need to sample. Now, once you have done your sampling, you perhaps you would like to understand what's going on. So you have to be uh, to to classify. You have to classify structures, and uh, eventually you would also like to be able to quantify the the progress of the uh, process that you are starting. You would like to identify reaction coordinates, and I. I would like to argue that for all of these um, problems, machine learning can be very, uh, very helpful. In the representation of potential energy surface, lots of progress has been made since the seminal work of Vela and Paranello and Gabor Chani and, and, and colleagues, uh, or, or, I don't know, 12, 15 years uh, uh, ago. Also, for coarse graining, machine learning can be be helpful. Same can be said for, for the sampling. Uh, for the sampling right now, very exciting developments are going on. Frank Noé proposed Boltzmann generators. Uh, Peter Wiensberg and colleagues, they used very similar normalizing flows to calculate free energies. And whenever a complicated function uh, living in a high dimensional space appears, you could try to use neural networks to represent it and, and use, and then uh, uh, make use of this in enhanced sampling methods like metadynamics and variational enhanced sampling, like was done uh, by Michele Parinello and, and group. Also, the classification of structures. Of course, that's a classic, a classic uh, task of machine learning classification. And it has been used to classify local structures, different crystalline or uh, amorphous structures in various materials. And finally, also in the identification of reaction coordinates, uh, machine learning has already had uh, quite an impact. Uh, it started quite early, actually, in the work of, uh, uh, of, of Ma and Dinner, who, who used neural networks to learn the committer and in a very similar, uh, very similar um, or you know, at least in, 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 the, in the goal <coughs> method based on likelihood maximization, uh, um, Darren Peters and Bernhard Trout, uh, they, uh, they uh, you know, basically developed a model that can be automatically parameterized to represent the, the committer. So this is what I would like to discuss. But so why, why do we believe, and, and in particular, you know, the, the this first, this second point here, the sampling problem and the identification of uh, reaction coordinates. These are problems where um, some progress has been made and it looks very promising, but uh, there is still a lot to be done. I think the representation of potential energy surfaces and also free energy surfaces and the classification of local structures, they are in a much more mature, mature state. So I don't believe that we can use machine learning and in particular generative models to uh, improve the sampling of statistically mechanical systems. I think that all of you have, um, all of that, well, actually, we can, this, this um, 
problems are of course not independent of each other. When you know a good reaction coordinate, then you can also use that knowledge to improve the sampling. But all of you probably have noticed these spectacular pictures that were that are made using uh, artificial in intelligence. Actually, there is this uh, this company. It's called Dalby, and they actually can do the following. They can from some text input they can can generate uh, images using diffusion models so for instance if you say an astronaut riding a horse in photorealistic style <laughs> this is one example that this software produces it doesn't always produce very meaningful stuff if you say salmon in walk in the river <laughs> <laughs> this is what it might produce. it's certainly salmon in the river maybe not the salmon that you had imagined if i told you a salmon in the salmon in the river now the thing is that you can actually um, do do it yourself you go to this web page of dal e and you register and then you can try to you know give them some text and see what uh, the software does with it. So for instance, if you say cow grazing in front of sick and building at the EPFL in beautiful fall colors, this is what I did. And this is what the, this AI software produces. It's, you know, I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, this, this looks a bit like this building um, and certainly the fall colors are, are beautiful. But well, not the fence is missing. The fence is missing. Yeah, we should. If you if you say with a nice fence, or I mean, you can you can also replace the cow with uh, sheep, and it's even more realistic because I have often seen the sheep grazing yeah. here. Yeah. The yeah. If you say workshop at the European Center for Atomistic and Molecular Calculations, this is what you get. I mean, if you look at the slide, it it at first sight it looks like okay, it looks like a typical slide, but then if you look closer, it doesn't really make. Uh, sense. You can also try out what happens actually, you know, if you start doing this, it's hard to stop. And you can, <laughs> you can, you can waste a perfectly fine afternoon uh, doing this. And the only thing that stops you is that after 50 pictures, they, you have to pay. <laughs> and then you stop if you're, if, you, if you're like me. So, but you can also check you know, ask, so uh, please make a picture of Kurt Kema simulating a polymer melt on a computer with molecular dynamic simulations. And this is what you get. I mean, nice haircut. <laughs> <laughs> or something more, something more abstract. What if you put in a, uh, um, the title of an article of Kurt? For instance, physical entanglements mediate coherent motion of the active topological gas confined with the spherical character. I mean, so here in this, here you see the spherical cavity. It's clearly glassy. There seems to be some ent entanglement. Is actually, I think, captivating what what this software is is able to is able to do. It's much faster. Huh? It's much faster. Much faster. <laughs> yes. So. How does it do with more abstract uh, concepts? For instance, the Kremer-Grest polymer model. This is what it produces. I mean, does it make sense? No, probably not. But, you know, it has some elements of, uh, you know, of a polymer model uh, built in. Now, this is where it get, gets crazy. You can also say, well, please paint the Kremer-Grest uh, model in the style of Picasso. And, and this is what you get. Now, let's play a game. Let's play a game. So if you ask the software to produce a picture of an entangled linear polymer melt in the style of, I show you the picture and you tell me, uh, and you tell me the artist. So who, who made this? Uh, this is Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol. Not quite. Why is it Mr. Uh, Keith Harry, but this is, I think this is the most difficult. So how about this one? Perfect. Uh, Ali. Ali, right, exactly. Uh, how about this one? Some will not be prepared. This was still free. How about this one? Exactly, Jackson, isn't this amazing? 
<laughs> Isn't this amazing? So this. What's her name? Georgia O'Keefe. Georgia O'Keefe. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so well, this is easier. Monte. 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 So I mean, this is quite quite amazing. Should we be able to make use of 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 uh, generative models also uh, in order to um, to sample to do statistical sample of statistically mechanical uh, systems? Now, why would you why would you do that? Actually, you want to do that because you want to get rid of cor correlations. I mean, if you do a molecular dynamic simulation or if you do a Monte Carlo simulation, you proceed in small steps. So you keep memory of the system you started from for quite a while. And if you do molecular dynamics, this of course has physical reasons. Uh, think about the simulation of, a, of liquid water. Now, how long does it take for a water molecule to break hydrogen bonds and to completely reorient? Well, this happens on a time scale of, let's say, 10 seconds or so. Now, if your molecular dynamic simulation uh, is done in time steps of the order of a femtosecond, this means that you need thousands of steps to produce a statistically, uh, statistically independent uh, configuration. And that costs, of course. Now, it costs even much more if you uh, imagine that you would like to, to uh, under certain conditions, let's say you take uh, water under freezing conditions, and you start from the liquid, and now you wait until it freezes. It takes, of course, a long time, probably much longer than you than than you than you can wait. Why? Because the freezing is a rare event where the system has to overcome uh, a, a barrier in order to go from the liquid to the from the metastable liquid to the thermodynamically preferred state, which is the solid. So also here you have the problem of correlations. If you're, if you're interested purely in static properties in finding out perhaps what how the phase diagram looks like, then it's very difficult to do this in a straightforward way just by running by running long MC or MB simulations because of the correlations that you necessarily have. And the same happens also if you uh, if you sample pathways, also a method like transition path sampling. In this method, you proceed from one pathway to the next by doing a a certain change and then accepting and rejecting. Also in that case, you have uh, correlations and they are costly and we would like, as we have learned, to save uh, electricity and CO2 by doing the calculations that we have to do as, uh, as quickly as possible. So it would be very nice if we had a method where we can generate new configurations in a one-shot way without you know, proceeding, in, proceeding in small steps. Now, all you have to do in order to do that is to come up with a transformation that takes you from a uh, that takes you from a probability density that is easy to sample, say a uniform uh, probability density or a multivariate Gaussian from this uh, what's called latent space. This transformation takes you to the what's called the data space. And the goal is to um, uh, design this transformation F such that the probability density in data space is the one that you want to sample. For instance, the Boltzmann distribution for, uh, for a, a, a particular system. Now, as people have pointed out, this is not so easy. In fact, if you go to the, to the beautiful book of Dan Franklin, Bear and Smith, they say this explicitly. They say, unfortunately, this simple important sampling scheme described previously, uh, and they mean a, a, a one where you come up with a trans transformation does not work because primarily because, and that's not the only reason, but primarily because you don't know the normalization. You don't know if you knew the normalization that corresponds to knowing the the partition function, so you know the free energy. So they say, well, then there would be hardly a need to do a computer simulation. So the the the, uh, the folklore was that this can cannot be done. But it turns out, actually, you it can be done using 
at least approximately, it can be done using normalizing flows. You can teach a neural network to learn this transformation from uh, the latent space to what's called the data space to produce a given probability density in the space that you are interested in. So how does the know how do the normalizing flows uh, do that? Actually, this is what what Frank Noé calls Boltzmann generators because uh, here they are used to uh, generate a Boltzmann distribution. This is done doing to, this is done uh, using a clever trick. And well, because why do you need this trick? The thing is that when you go from one uh, distribution in latent space to the distribution that you want, you also need to be able to compute the uh, determinant of the Jacobian. You know, because this, this transformation will compress a phase space or it will expand it. And this is, and you need to take that into account if you want to know what the distribution is that results when you apply this transformation. This is just what you always have when you transform variables. Then you also change the distribution by a factor that depends on, on, on the Jacobian. So you need to be able to compute the Jacobian. And this can be done with this cute trick that in which uh, the, uh, the um, variables are uh, divided into two parts. And then one part is untransformed and the other one is transformed by doing scaling and translation, but in a way that depends on the other set of, of variables. And then you repeat this a number of times, I don't know, five, 10 times, you have such blocks, one of the, after the other. And each of these transformations is represented by a neural network. And due to this particular structure, these are called split coupling flows, due to this particular structure, it's easy to compute the, um, the Jacobian of the, of the transformation. And for a particular mapping, you know what the distribution is that, that results. Now, how should you do the training here of these neural networks? You need to do the training in a way such that the distribution produced by the transformation is as close as possible to the target distribution. And to measure how close these distributions are, you, you use the uh, Kullbeck libel divergence. Now it turns out, it turns out that um, this optimization corresponds to a free energy minimization. Like it has two terms, this Kullbeck libel divergence, an energetic term and if you think about it, this is an entropic term. Now you could actually minimize this energetic term by mapping all the points in, in latent space to the minimum of the energy in, uh, which would be here, to the minimum of the energy in, in, in data space. But then there is an entropic price that you have to pay and the entropic, uh, the entropic term here, which is controlled by temperature, makes sure that this doesn't happen, that there is a spread in, in the right way. So you have a balance here between energy and, um, and, and entropy in this minimization procedure. Now, this can be done, but, but and it's actually difficult to overestimate the importance. So if you could do this perfectly, which you cannot at the moment, but imagine if you could, then you could calculate, for instance, calculate phase diagrams in a very, very simple way from single configurations that, that you generate. Why do I say that? Well, imagine you have a phase diagram, right? Phase diagram of water. Here you have ice and vapor. Now, for certain conditions in pressure and, and, and temperature, let's say we put ourselves here in this position. The likelihood to find the system in one phase compared to the likelihood to find it in the other phase is governed by the free energy difference between the two phases. Now, the free energy difference is an extensive quantity. So if you're not exactly at coexistence in a system of a certain size, one phase is always overwhelmingly more 
likely than the other. And this is the phase that is, is thermodynamically stable. So what does that mean for uh, if we are able to generate configurations in a one-shot way with the right probability? This means that in order to find out whether the system at this point is liquid, solid, or, or, or a vapor, we need it suffices to generate one single configuration and look what we have. Why? Because all the other phases have a probability that is lower by a large factor. For instance, if we put ourselves close to coexistence, have a system you know, just one degree below freezing uh, for 10,000 water molecules, then you can figure out that the solid is 10 to the 29 times more likely than, than the liquid. So the problem is, of course, to find such a uh, such a, uh, a a mapping that can do this accurately. But if we could do it, that would be that would be a big thing. Now, nothing is perfect except quote Kramer, at least today. <laughs> nothing is perfect. So all also these uh, these mappings, these normalizing flows that you find, they are not perfect, but they are good enough to allow you to reweight. You know, if you have a, a way to produce configurations that are do not follow exactly the right distribution, but almost, then you can do some reweighting and obtain the distribution that you are that you are looking for. And I mean, this is a little example where we have tried to map between two states of uh, in a liquid that differ by temperature or equivalently by uh, the differ in the interaction potential between the particles. And you can see that here, if you look at the distribution of the energy, the, 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 the blue one, which you can hardly see because it's covered by the red one, that's the target. This is the untransformed, um, and then you transform, then you get this one. So it's not the perfect uh, learning, but then you can uh, reweight in order to get the distribution that you, you want. Perhaps this is also a, a way to you know, switch between different levels of uh, resolution. But if you transform one liquid into another liquid? Yes, one liquid into another liquid. So we tried it here for liquid before it was done only for, um, for, 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 for solids. So doing explicit solvent for biomolecules is still a difficult thing. So we are, I mean, this is, I think at the, at the stage where you can say this is promising how far the community, the community will be able to, to push this is to me at least not, not clear yet. What you can also try to do is to combine it with other methods. And this is very interesting. So, uh, so uh, Frank Noe in, in his group has combined normalizing flows with replica exchange where instead of having many, many uh, different temperature levels, he maps from the high temperature directly to the low temperature, or, uh, or Eric van der Leinen has used these normalizing flows in order to generate trial moves for, for Monte Carlo. So I think that there are many possibilities to apply this, um, these normalizing flows to improve, um, to improve sampling. Now, what I would like to talk about now is how to use these normalizing flows in order to improve the sampling of, of pathways. So imagine you do transition path sampling simulation. If you do that, then you imagine that you start from a path, pick a point along the path, and then you generate a new one. And this path is then accepted or rejected. And now, of course, also this procedure generates correlations because it takes a while for the sampling to forget the path that you started with, right? So typically, if you, if you measure correlations, you find out that thousands of paths are required to produce a statistically new path. So would it be nice if we, could do it uh, without these correlations. And this is particularly relevant if you look at transitions between um, stable states that can occur via different pathways. Uh, look, look, at this, look at this example here, where you have two stable states and then the pathway can, the system can go from A to B via the top here or via, via the bottom. So, this, the model has a potential energy surface that is just shaped that, that, that way that that happens. Now, if this barrier here in the middle is large, then it, it will be hard to 
find both classes of pathways just by moving from one pathway to the, to the next, and each one is only slightly different from the previous one. So also here, one could try to make some progress using normalizing flows by generating shooting points with a normalizing, a properly trained normalizing flow. So imagine that you have this Gaussian distribution in latent space, and then you, you use a normalizing flow to produce shooting points from which you shoot off trajectories, and then you reweight the trajectories to correct for the imperfect and neural uh, and normalizing flow. You can do this again with, uh, with uh, split coupling flows, but now you do that by introducing some, some bias because you don't want to generate your shooting points completely at random. You want to generate them in, in regions where the trajectories that you shoot off have a certain likelihood to succeed. And you can do that by including, uh, uh, by also learning a bias uh, in, in, in this procedure to train uh, to train the normalizing flows. Now, if you do that for a, for a simple 2D model using these training data, then you find out that you can, can uh, do the simulation in a much more efficient uh, way. So what's plotted here is the fraction of trajectories that go through the upper channel, like, like for instance here. Uh, and since this model is symmetric, this fraction should be one half. Now each line here is the result of a different uh, TPS simulation. And you see here that very often, even after 10,000 uh, trials, you, you don't get the right ratio because the path is stuck in one of the channels. Now, this is another, this is another TPS algorithm, not much better, but if you're able to generate these pathways uh, independently from each other, of course, then this average there uh, will, will converge much, much faster. Well, uh, another, another advantage of being able to apply this one shot sampling is that you can do it trivially in parallel. You know, what, I mean, if you do, you cannot, a Monte Carlo simulation is not easy to parallelize simply because each configuration depends on the previous one, right? So you have to see it sequentially. But if you don't have these correlations, then you can do a number of independent, uh, you know, simulations, generation moves that that uh, that you then in the end can can simply combine. It would be completely independent. Would uh, would be another big advantage of such generative models. So we also did it for a polymer. So for this talk, I tried to collect all the work that I ever did with polymers, and this is all I could come up. <laughs> This is a pretty baby uh, version of a, a polymer, but the transition that we studied here was from, from the, from the com compact version of uh, configuration of this, of this polymer to a more ex extended one. So if you then apply this, um, this normalizing flow algorithm to generate shooting points, then you, you indeed discover different, different pathways that can lead you from this stable state to, to the more compact one. And you find if you try to measure more quantitatively how fast correlations decay, you find, of course, that this, uh, this normalized flow uh, uh, method converges, it leads to results that converge, uh, converge much, much quicker. OK, so how much time do I still have? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. OK, then let me, let me talk about another polymer. That this is the second, second polymer that I did that I shamelessly use here for, for, this, uh, for this talk. The following question. So this is a, a very simple polymer that was studied by, um, by uh, Kurt Binder and, uh, and colleagues some time ago. And this is a polymer that has uh, the non bonded interactions is basically a, a square well potential. With a, with a width of the square well that can be regulated. If one calculates the phase diagram of this polymer, then one finds that for, uh, for, while for a wide well, if I 
go down in temperature, there is first a continuous transition from the coil to the globule. And then later, a first order like transition from the globule to the crystal. But if you make this well narrow enough, then you find out that there is a direct transition from the extended coil to the crystal. So the question now is how does this transition happen? So this is the question that we wanted uh, to answer. What is a good reaction coordinate for this uh, transition that describes how far this transition has already proceeded? Now, we know what a good measure of uh, such a transition is, namely the committer. Why? Because the committer, which is the probability that for, from a certain configuration, the system will uh, go into one of the stable states rather than the other. We know that the committer basically tells you what is likely to happen next. If the committer, let's say, is uh, a one, this means that basically all the trajectories that you start from that particular configuration will go to, let's say here, the crystalline state. If it's close to zero, that means that none of the trajectories will actually make it to the crystalline state. Most of them will uh, go to the coil, uh, to the coil state. Configurations that are in between have a committer of one half. So the committer actually measures whether you are still at the beginning of this transition or uh, uh, on, on, on the barrier, so to speak, or you are already close to the final, to the final state. So, but what we would like to have is to have, although this committer is in principle a good reaction coordinate, we would like to parameterize the committer with some variables that carry more physical meaning. For instance, the energy or the crystallinity um, or I don't know, the uh, eigenvalues of the inertia tensor, the ranges of duration, you can put, come up with a number of variables where you suspect that they could have uh, a, an effect. Now, if you then compare, for instance, in this case for the freezing polymer, if you compare configurations <laughs> like we did here that have a committer of one half, so these are all transition states, you find some similarities, but all the variables that you that you might come up uh, with, namely the crystallinity or the number in this crystalline core that you can particles in this crystalline core uh, that you can detect, or the number of um, such filaments that protrude from the crystalline core or the energy, they all don't. You know, they they all of them they don't do a good job in telling you. Uh, whether you are know, in, in parameterizing the, the committer. So the idea was to use machine learning in order to do that. And basically, this is what already Ma and, uh, and, and Dina, Dina did um, many years ago. So we trained the neural network to learn the committer based on, uh, based on configurations and committers calculated from them. And we find that the, uh, that the neural network can indeed learn the, can indeed learn the committer. In this plot, we have plotted the learned committer versus the sample committer. Also, the sample committer has a certain a certain uh, error built in because you estimate the committer from a finite uh, number of trajectories, so automatically it has an error that that explains this, the spread that you that you see here. Then later you can actually go and uh, and uh, analyze which which um, of the parameters that you have used as an input for the, for the neural network actually are important by doing some kind of important ana analysis and then you find okay you can you can identify them it, it it so you find that these are indeed the variables that you suspect that that they play a role but they need to come they need to be combined in in, in a certain way. None of these parameters by itself can do the job, but if you combine it in the, in the right way, you can do it and, and you can actually do some symbolic re, uh, regression uh, with the genetic algorithm to find an analytic expression that combines these, uh, that combines these variables and provides an analytic version of the, of the, of the committer. So, and when you do this, and this is work of Roberto Copino and the Jung and Gerhard Humo, with whom we collaborated, you, you look in the space of 
um, mathematical expressions and combine them. And then you have also a rather regularization that limits the number of terms that you can have your sum. It's a kind of, kind of a chemical potential for the number of terms. So if you make this chemical potential uh, large, then that reduces the number of, um, of terms. And if you make it low, then you can have more, you can have more terms. So what results here is a, is a model for the committer, which then you can use in a kind of reinforcement step, right? Because if you know, if you have a function of uh, an, uh, an estimator for the committer, then you can con concentrate your sampling or your generation of shooting points in the areas where you are likely to produce trajectories that are reactive. They go from one of the stable states um, to the other. And by the way, this is also, I believe, uh, uh, something that can be combined with these generative models, where you also need some, some bias to make these models generate the shooting points in the right regions. And this can be basically learned on the fly. Why? Because every path that you generate in, um, in your simulation is an instance uh, is an, is, is an instance of the likelihood function that you use as the loss function to train to train this network. So you can improve your sampling as you move along and, and, and Gerhard and his, uh, and, and Peter and, and whole group. So they have um, calculated, have applied this idea to problems like uh, the assembly of ions or the formation of uh, cloth rates or uh, the, um, assembly of transmembrane uh, proteins. So uh, what are the conclusions? So is, is machine learning for molecular simulation a hype? Of course it is. I mean, everybody is doing, um, is doing machine learning for molecular simulation. So it's certainly a hype, but it's going to stay. I'm convinced this is going to change the way we are, we are doing computer simulations both in how we do the computer simulations, but perhaps more importantly, how we analyze, how we analyze, uh, how we analyze the results. So uh, th this is, I think, a powerful tool that we will have, that we we can use in in the future when we do computer simulations. So what are the successes so far? I think the representation of potential energy surfaces is a spectacular success. This can also be done on the fly. You go along. You know, doing an ab initial simulation, you learn uh, the energy of configurations that are needed, but not more. And then in doing so, you, you replace the expensive calculation by, by the cheaper one in a, in a way where you don't need to figure out everything in advance, all the training set in advance, but only train using the configurations that you need that you are visiting. Promises. Well, the promises are. I think the, the, the use of these generative models for statistical sampling in statistical mechanical systems. There are some interesting results, but I think we are not quite there yet. We'll see what happens in the next couple of years, but I think this is something that will, uh, will have a, a, an impact. Our challenges, of course, the, the interpretability, I mean, something that Kurt has, has mentioned, we would like to understand too, of course, and not just the computer. And But if we think of machine learning as, as a tool that helps us in this endeavor to understand, I think it can be extremely uh, useful, even, even though in many machine learning applications, you cannot really tell whether how it, it, it worked uh, in detail. Like you cannot really say, maybe some people can say, but it's, it's hard to say how these models generate these, um, these pictures. So I think overall we are in a stage where we are scratching on the surface of what material, machine learning can do uh, for materials modeling. And I expect to see some interesting stuff coming up in the years to come. So let me just conclude with a, with a picture that represents uh, then one of my heroes. This picture was generated without machine, without artificial <laughs> intelligence, actually was drawn by a student of mine, Bernhard Eichel. Um, 
back then. Uh, I asked him to, 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 to draw this because I imagine, okay, what would have, what would Boltzmann have done with a computer? I think he would have done um, uh, wonderful stuff. I think he would have done perhaps the things that Kurt Kramer, <laughs> Kurt Kramer has done uh, so far in his career. Thank you. Questions? Saro? Thank you. Sir. Thank you. This was really very fascinating. Albert, I don't want to sound philosophical, but I have just a question for you. So, uh, you probably have heard about PIN, the physics inspired neural networks, which seems to be pretty successful just because they enforce physical constraints on researchers. Isn't that true that here you are just doing the opposite because you get rid of the constraints due to causality? Because that's in the end. No, I, you know, I, I, so I'm fascinated. I have this two approaches just at the extreme of the spectrum. I think the more phases you can put into it, it the better it is. But you're getting rid. But often, <laughs> yes, because we don't, often you don't know how to put in the physics. I mean, if you are able to put in the physics in terms of symmetries, you know, wonderful. You should definitely do it. Everything you know and you can put in, you, you should. But then at the same time, you you don't want to introduce a prejudice, right, of the model that you are ex expecting. And, but this is not a prejudice. Is called causality. You go in small steps because physics is, is made this way, right? And that's a needless constraint for your purpose, which is to get to the right point in one shot. If uh, I understand correctly. Sure, so I be, but I believe, you know, I believe you can do better if you try to include more, more physics. But not I, 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 that, that, that's what I believe. It has to be like that. Yes. So the, the more physics, the, the better. Stefan? Uh, we had been uh, recently in a workshop where there was a diagram about the CPU time and electricity increase uh, due to uh, uh, deep learning, you know, work by deep learning. So it has, it has really also an impact. <laughs> but the question I have is, uh, on the very early beginning of the transparency, had an overview where this is used. And there was also, uh, you mentioned also magnetism. Of the I, I meant magnetism? Uh, magnetism. There was also uh, one uh, item, magnetism. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. No, yeah. as an example of it's a rare event. Yes. As an example of a rare event. Yes, you know, example of a rare event. Yes, exactly. And uh, what we have in the field of magnetism, typically we know the ground state is paramagnetic, but we have a, a data bit. We want to understand the lifetime of this data bit, for example. And so what we can do is typically something like transition state theory. So we have complicated methods. We have spin models, complicated methods. We calculate passes and things like that. So I, I would like to relate this to your uh, approach. Um, so we have also then a harmonic series and you know, some dynamics and like that. Do you think with your approach we can get um, transition states if you cannot catch in the original way? Yeah, I I I, I don't know. Okay. But so, the, so the, the example I was referring to was a phenomenological description of, of a magnetic uh, domain. And then you can, uh, uh, people use methods like the string method or forward flux sampling yes. in order to calculate the switching yeah. of this domain. I don't know if you, in this case, you have a number of competing pathways that you could, that you would like to sample uh, in the like, in, in, in the correct Proportion. So I don't know enough about okay. these magnetic uh, systems. If that's the case, then I believe that, uh, oh, of course, oh, what you also need to know is the equilibrium distribution. Yeah. Right? The thermal yeah. distribution. But yeah. if you know that, then you can apply apply uh, apply these these methods. So they are not. They they. I don't think they are restricted to um, uh, at atomistic models. I mean, you can also think of using such methods to. Uh, in the context text of continuum descriptions, mm -hmm. like of magnetic systems, whether that's needed there, I I, I don't I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just included it here as a yeah. as an example yeah. for a rare event. Yeah.
Sarah? So I had a question, and there is a question from the audience. You mentioned that the notion of using these Boston generators, for example, to go from a false grain to a, a relativistic model, but then you're changing the number of degrees of freedom yes. in the system. And that transformation is trivial in this case? No, no, I don't think it's it, it's trivial. You would have, I mean, what you would have is perhaps that you have some, you would first have to add var variables that are inert, so to speak. And then due to this, due to this uh, mapping, they are transformed in some physic in, into some physically meaningful uh, variables. I mean, it's the same problem that Kurt also mentioned. When you, when you go, of course, you lose information. But you can try to, to generate a uh, configuration at higher resolution that is compatible with the average that you use in, in the constraint model. And for, for this, I, you, I, I believe you can use um, a normalizing flows. You should be able to use normalizing flows. So, so they can deal. They could reconstruct this in terms of transformations that are translations and rotations, because that's it seems like it's all right. Uh, yes, yes, but, but these are you, you have to remember these are concatenation, concatenations of these transformations. So I they, they can be as complex as needed. You just need to concatenate a sufficient number of these these blocks. I don't think this is a limitation of the method that it does translations. Uh, translations and scalings because they can be done in a complicated arrangement. Then I ask the question from Ben Schuler. Uh, thank you for the exciting perspective on machine learning. Are there already good examples of learning about the underlying physics for machine learning results? <laughs> I, I don't know. This is a very, very good question. There is a huge literature out there. I mean, like in, a, in our case, I think we were able to determine the variables that are important to characterize a, a certain transition. I think that here really the machine learning, machine learning, uh, machine learnings have to identify these variables. Then if you don't believe what the machine learning tells you, it's still very useful because you can test, right? You can really test if these variables do what you want, want them to do. So I think this is an example where this uh, where this happened. Uh, there are many other examples out there in the, in, in the literature, also beyond the domain that I was talking about, but I'm really not, not an expert yet. I don't view myself here as the machine learning person. I'm just this, uh, you know, molecular simulator that tries to steal some, um, some tools that are out there to, to help in what we are doing. What? I'm still trying to wrap my head around this generating thing. So, so I mean, when we do classical simulations, what we're trying to do is we're trying to generate an ensemble of true Isings, true Kramer crests. I mean, you name the model, right? And we, we try to generate, I mean, corresponding microstates with a proper false grain. And now comes machine learning and what it produces is, I mean, like exactly what you, I think that's why you let us do these pictures, right? Because it, it, it produces probably very realistic looking fake Isaacs, fake Kermagress, fake Heisenberg model configuration. I mean, that, that's what it could do, right? I don't like how you say fake. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, that's right now. And then the thing is, if, and that's what I got out of what you were saying is, and maybe that that then fake can be corrected. If but if you say we know the statistical weight of the configurations that we have, and then we can reweight them with a proper Boltzmann weight, then this is getting interesting. Is that what you're saying? No. So I, the the goal is that you produce that you're able to. Um, the goal is to obtain a transformation that produces the right distribution in the first place. And that's hard. You know, so one aspect that perhaps I have not emphasized enough is the training. 
So these networks, they need to be trained, of course, and they can be trained in two different ways. One is called training by example. The other one is training by energy because these are invertible transformations. So you can go from data space to latent space or the other way around and both can in, in both directions you can do you can do training but what what you need then of course is a, a sample of typically configurations and, and you need to be able to compute the energy for them so the, the neural network is taught based on the energy of the system that it should learn so it's not out of thin air no, no, that you can a, that's parameterize. Why, that's why I was saying it's, it's not yes. stupid. It's, and it's, it's, a, it's a fake, but I mean, whatever. It's I an approximation. So it's a, it's an approximation. And, 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 you know, with any approximation, if, you, uh, if the approximation is sufficiently good, then you can do a reweighting and, and, uh, and compute the true average that corresponds to that, to that model that you have chosen. Yeah, well, I think what Ralph was, was trying to get at was, uh, well, it is an approximation, and the, but the question is, uh, do we have sort of reliable error estimates that we know how far the, uh, uh, the, generated, uh, uh, the generated distribution, how far this is away from the well, distribution? Yeah, yes, uh, in fact, you can do that, you can, Calculate the the reweighting factor, and that you can view as a measure for how uh, you, you know how the probability of the approximated distribution compares to the probability in the true distribution. You can compare these uh, reweighting factors. Mm -hmm. and if, if you don't, and then you know the cubic LIBOR divergence. Of course, that's a, a measure integrated overall overall points tells you how distant, how, how good the model actually is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. A very short uh, question at the end. So uh, uh, you showed this, this example at the very end where, where you found where the, your system found these different structures. One of the very interesting questions for, for mm -hmm. of course, is, is for dynamics. Mm -hmm. and the way you presented it, you typically have a, a Say and then you can decide. You can decide in which direction this would go in, in case you analyze it further. Do you see a chance to look really at dynamics of systems? I mean, so the the, the maybe this was not clear enough. But when you when you do so, what we try to do is to use machine learning to improve transition path sampling. So in transition path sampling, every trajectory is a trajectory that does the true dynamics. You use the dynamic propagation rule that you believe in. I mean, I don't know, Langevin dynamics or Newtonian dynamics, whatever you... Well, you have a subtle point aspect. No? You either go here or you go there. But in many cases, you do not have that. Well, you don't, you don't have a subtle point that you need to define in... Uh, as a set point in on the potential energy surface that you don't need, right? I mean, you, you do this by characterizing transition states statistically, but but they are you know this this criteria which tells you that a certain configuration is a transition state is based on has a dynamic a dynamic component. I mean, or in order to determine that, you need to know the dynamics of the system. So. This is important. I mean, the, the dynamics along each pathway is the true dynamics that the system that the system has. This distinguishes a path sampling from uh, other enhanced sampling methods where you work more, you know, statically in the sense that you do not care about the, the dynamics, but rather just uh, about the distribution of configurations. So we try to. One can also view this as a way to keep some dynamics in your simulation while at the same time enhancing the sampling of the important parts of configuration space. Okay, I think that's a good point to, uh, to stop. Uh, thank you very much, Crystal, again for this uh, presentation. Uh, last speaker of this municipality, Matthew Thoreau from Chicago.
we'll talk about the electrostatic self assembly and charge back and forth. Actually, when we were discussing about this mini symposium, I mean, CCAM is about molecular simulation, but we thought it was uh, clearly uh, important also to bring an experimentalist that could be able to interact with this. Uh, simulators so that's why we thought of Matthew and actually we even move forward because you saw that in the first presentation by Jean-Francois we have also seen other experiments and theories so I think that helps to provide a more broad perspective about what are challenges so please Matthew thank, thank you very much I, I appreciate that uh, uh, explanation because I'm here with some trepidation partly because you know I don't do any calcul atomic or molecular uh, uh, and not European, but I really appreciate being here for a number of reasons. First and foremost, the, my 40 year association with Court as a friend and scientific colleague. I'm pretty sure we first met at the Polymer Physics Gordon Conference in 1982 in New Hampshire. So that makes it almost exactly 40 years and have met many times uh, since then uh, at each other's homes in various parts of North America and in Germany. And uh, it's really been a pleasure. Um, certainly uh, this has been mentioned in passing, but this paper really provided uh, a, a huge uh, uh, landmark in uh, the polymer physics literature uh, in the late eighties, uh, being an experimentalist who at the time was working on entangled polymers and trying to understand the physics, this uh, ability of simulations, as, as Kurt pointed out, to look at what's going on locally in a way that you can really almost never do experimentally, really changed the field. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to be speaking uh, in, in honor of Kurt's prize. Uh, I mentioned to some people at lunch too, I also uh, have a very good feeling about Lausanne. I, I spent the summer of 1988 here, which was quite some time ago, back around this time, actually. I was also here on September 11th, uh, 2001, which uh, got burned into my brain. Uh, as I, I was actually driving along the lake and listening to the radio after lunch. And uh, my French is decent, but I thought, is this really what I'm hearing? And uh, I, pulled, I pulled off the road and called my wife from here. And, uh, found out it was true. Anyway, uh, what I'm going to talk about here is a topic that's becoming uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, it's actually uh, pretty very active in polymer physics and becoming very interesting in uh, biophysics and, and uh, biology in general, which is the phase separation that occurs when two polyelectrolytes are mixed. Uh, this has been done for a long time. It's not a new process but the attention and the fundamental attention focused on it is relatively new and some new insights are coming out uh, because of that. So if you look at the upper left-hand part, the simple uh, experimental situation to think about, and it's often exactly what we do, is take a dilute solution of a polyanion and a dilute solution of a polycation and pour them together. The interesting situation is when they form a fluid, at least, interesting to most of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so that's a liquid-liquid uh, phase separation. You don't always get that. You sometimes get solid phase precipitation, and I'll bring up examples of, of when that occurs. But when it's fluid, you have a material that can reconfigure. It can be used with some innovations in molecular architecture for self-assembly and creating other objects. Um, the droplets themselves typically have a lot of water in them. Uh, almost all of the polymer ends up inside the droplets. But since there's so much water in the droplets, the interfacial tension between the droplets and water is almost zero. And therefore, they've been known for a long time to help stabilize particle dispersions. They engulf particles and spread on surfaces. They can be used for encapsulation of particles and proteins. I first got interested in it on the lower left when I was in Santa Barbara. And my marine biology colleagues discovered that there were these organisms that had a physiological apparatus that enabled them to co-extrude uh, positively and negatively charged proteins to create an underwater adhesive that they used to glue together sand grains and make a habitat underwater. So uh, that's where this started in, in my group. But over the last decade, biologists have really come to, to the fore 
in the identification of the things on the lower part of the diagram of membraneless bodies inside of cells that perform various functions, uh, a lot of different interesting functions. They are typically, uh, but not always, uh, uh, complexes uh, between uh, negatively charged nucleic acids and uh, positively charged proteins, often uh, intrinsically disordered proteins, which have been mentioned, or intrinsically disordered regions of proteins. Uh, and they form functional bodies that are not surrounded by lipid membranes. And I'm going to close this talk by, uh, and I'm going to have a little bit to say about that. I'm going to close this talk by looking at the also the speculations that people have made about how this might be related to origins of life. So, as I said, this field has been around for a long time. And the first theoretical phase diagram was produced um, in Wageningen by the group led by Theo Overbeek, 1957, you'll see, uh, is the uh, date of this paper. And they did something very simple, but very intelligent at the time. They took uh, the Flory Huggins uh, entropy of mixing, uh, which was the right-hand term at the top, and added a debye huckel term that just uh, added an energy associated with a certain number of charges in a certain volume of fluid. And out of that, they produced this very plausible looking phase diagram that has a two phase region, a critical point in salt concentration <clears throat> and tie lines between the dilute phase and the dense phase. And this looking at this was the thing that got me very interested in possibly for the wrong reasons, so, as I'll explain, um, in looking at this in a more fundamental polymer physics way. As you see, the tie lines here are positively sloped. And that seemed to me to be wrong. <laughs> it just seemed, and you'll see it's not wrong, but uh, I, I, I really fixated on that and uh, thought it just not likely that there would be more salt per unit volume in the dense phase than in the, in the dilute phase. So we set out to try to uh, study this in simpler ways. As I said, this phenomenon has been known for a long time, but it was really introduced by studying things like gelatin and gum arabic and complicated polysaccharides and proteins and stuff like that. So we decided to try to pick a set of polymers where the backbones were identical, and if you use uh, racemic polypeptides, as I'm showing here, uh, there's not much of a chance. The, the things that make you get solvent phase precipitation, I should have said earlier on, are uh, extra hydrophobic interactions, hydrogen bonding, very strong charging uh, between the two. So I'm going to show you data on uh, polylysine and polyglutamic acid, which, again, they're racemic. Um, we can make them in essentially identical lengths. And the only thing that's different is a few methylene groups in the side chain, and that doesn't matter very much. So uh, a graduate student um, in uh, Chicago, Lou Lee, a couple of years ago, painstakingly measured the phase diagram of polylysine and polyglutamic acid at several different chain lengths. You see that the two-phase region increases with increasing chain length. Um, uh, she measured it in two different ways, by measuring the compositions of the two phases in equilibrium directly, and also by measuring the salt uh, necessary at any given polymer volume fraction. The polymer volume fraction there is the volume fraction the, of the two polymers, which are there in stoichiometrically equal amounts, measuring the salt necessary to dissolve the, uh, the two-phase uh, 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 two material. Uh, the, the data on the right-hand side are uh, the same data, but plotted on a logarithmic axis that just shows a, a minor point that the polymer concentration in the supernatant isn't exactly zero, which some people had assumed to get easier measurements of the phase diagram, and I wanted to make the point. But I was very satisfied, and we made a big point of this in the paper, that we have negatively sloped tie lines, and we argued, we meaning Juan de Pablo and me, that this might have had to do with the absence of correlations in the born overbeak theory, uh, which didn't really say anything about, um, did I do something to make this, my presentation go away up here? Or is it just because I'm talking? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, so anyway, we were satisfied with this and 
we published this paper, which has gotten good attention. There's nothing wrong with this paper, except our kind of uh, dogmatic insistence that the timelines have to be negative. <laughs> um, it's starting to attract a lot of theory. And that's, that was really our point, to produce a body of data that theorists wouldn't waste their time working on because there were extraneous molecular complications, that this is really uh, uh, indicative of the behavior of two threads, one negatively charged and one positively charged uh, coming together. Um, the parameters of the born overbeek theory for a particular system can easily be estimated. And the, uh, the top curve there, um, not sure if I'm doing this right. Yeah, here we go. The top curve there is the straightforward application of what we think is the are the parameters of the born overbeek theory. And uh, you can see that it doesn't fit our data well. If you try to arbitrarily adjust the critical point, you do even worse on the dense uh, branch of the two-phase diagram. A bunch of good theorists, uh, Glenn Fredrickson at Santa Barbara, Jen Dong Wong at Caltech, and others, Mutu at, at uh, UMass and Charles Singh, have, are working on this. Um, a, a paper in, around the time our uh, own paper came out by Zhen Gang uh, applied some uh, modeling of correlations from liquid state theory and in the lower left-hand diagram, get something that looks more like our data. So I think there is something that relates to correlations here. Uh, but the theory still uh, needs a lot of work, I think, to, uh, to actually accurately model all of the interactions that produce this liquid-liquid uh, phase separation. One thing that is very important and not immediately obvious when you think of two highly charged, two highly oppositely charged uh, molecules is what is really the driving force uh, for this liquid-liquid phase separation. And uh, we've measured uh, the thermodynamics of this using isothermal titration calorimetry, where you put one uh, sample into the calorimeter and then small aliquots of the other are added. And you measure the uh, power necessary to keep the thing at constant temperature. And from some reasonable fitting of those data, you can extract the enthalpic and entropic contributions. And you can see that the entropic contribution is a lot bigger, which uh, is uh, at first thought, at least we thought and others have thought, due to the fact that if you have two already uh, long entropically challenged strings of charge, and they can come together and neutralize one another, you can liberate a lot of little counter ions. And that certainly is a factor in this, but uh, Zhen Gang Wang has continued to work on this. And a paper that he's published recently in PNAS argues that the temperature dependence of the dielectric constant of water gives a very big con entropic contribution to this electrostatic interaction. So in other words, uh, in addition to uh, releasing small counter ions, there's a large entropic contribution, according to Chen Gang, arising from solvent reorganization when this happens. So let's stay tuned for more on this. This is about the status of the experiment and uh, theory uh, in this area. I said you don't always get liquid liquid phase separation. If you use chiral polypeptides, uh, but the same ones, uh, polyglutamic acid and polylysine, if you use a chiral pair, and it doesn't matter if it's uh, LL, DD, or any DL combination, as you can see in the upper left of these uh, figures, instead of getting droplets, you get a solid precipitate. That's due to the fact that these regularly chiral polymers are able to hydrogen bond with one another, form beta sheets, and precipitate out of solution. Another factor that uh, may be related to certain aspects of uh, biological condensates, but we were looking at it a few years ago for another reason, is that we found that if you take polylysine and complex it with nucleic acids in the single-stranded form, you get liquid-liquid phase separation, as the picture on the left shows. But if you complex it with a double-stranded DNA, you very often, and uh, in this paper always, uh, get uh, solid uh, precipitation. And um, we've studied this, for example, with single-stranded DNA on the top, 
um, at, at all salt concentrations, you get liquid phase separation. If you put double-stranded DNA of the same chain length, let's say, and add salt, you can drive the uh, precipitate into, uh, into fluid droplets. Um, it, uh, if you start with uh, droplets of uh, single-stranded DNA in, in both cases here, but then you add droplets of either non-complementary DNA or complementary DNA. Uh, if you add non-complementary DNA, you get more droplets and they don't do anything. But if you add DNA that can hybridize with the DNA that's already there, these things uh, hybridize and form solid precipitates um, under those circumstances. Um, the uh, DNA that say more double-stranded, either by more overlap in a partially overlapping duplex DNA or more stem length in a hairpin DNA. Basically, the more uh, double-stranded it is, the more likely it is to form precipitates. So there's big secondary structure and uh, structural element to this uh, when you're talking about polypeptide uh, DNA complexation. And uh, why is this? Uh, we believe it's due to the higher charge density, higher linear charge density in double-stranded DNA. You, you might think it's twice as much, but in fact, the helix causes the molecule to contract axially. It's about four times as much. And in any case, uh, the thing on the right, the two images on the right show that if by um, um, fluoro uh, sulfonate substitution uh, on the phosphate group, we reduce the charge on the DNA molecules. A less charged DNA, chemically modified, does not uh, form so fluid precipitates, a fluid coacerbates fluid, does not precipitate but forms fluid phase separation. So that's of interest and, and generally speaking, uh, I wouldn't say it's absolutely always true, but it's predominantly true that if you have double-stranded DNA, you're going to get solid complexes. We were particularly interested in this at the time. Now it's about four years ago, because in another part, I'm going to show you some actual practical applications of this. Um, we have been thinking about using both the self-assembly character that's built into polyelectrolyte complexation and uh, um, the molecular architecture to create micelles with nucleic acids in the core to deliver them for various therapeutic purposes. And um, uh, they're, they're quite readily formed. And if you can make an object like this, as the, as the slide says, uh, the corona will protect against nucleates attack. Uh, you can put targeting entities on the periphery of these things. This works for a wide variety of nucleic acids. And so, you know, we're looking at this. Uh, other people are look, looking at this kind of formulation for cancer. We're looking at it for heart disease. Um, but the size and the shape of the micelles affect circulation time and how effective these are as therapeutic agents. Um, if you use single stranded DNA, um, both by cryo electron microscopy and small angle X ray scattering, which levels off at low Q, uh, both indicating very nice spherical uh, micelles with the nucleic acid in the core and pretty low polydispersity. But if you try to do this with double stranded DNA, the figure on the left shows that it, you have something that's uh, a small angle X-ray scattering curve that looks like worm-like micelles. And these things under the electron microscope are very extended, not particularly appropriate for injecting into the bloodstream, uh, which is I'm gonna show you right now. So about four slides on heart disease. Uh, atherosclerosis and related things are inflammatory diseases. And uh, I'm not sure if I can control this very well, but you, Look right here, the, the first thing that happens on inflammation, either due to uh, lipid in the bloodstream, or in fact, more often due to turbulent blood flow in the neighborhood, is that the endothelial lining gets inflamed and um, 
the endothelial lining upregulates uh, receptors, vascular cell adhesion molecule, where VCAM is one of the most prominent ones. And they're there to recruit white blood cells to come in and deal with the inflammation. I don't want to go on with any more of this, but this is what happens when the endothelial lining uh, becomes inflamed. And that eventually leads, I should have said, I guess, that, that eventually leads to atherosclerosis or other kinds of blockage of the blood vessels. Um, it turns out that that is uh, largely uh, promoted by a small micro RNA in the uh, endothelial lining, this mRNA 92A that contributes to the pro inflammatory phenotype. And there's a commercial inhibitor of that thing, which is itself a nucleic acid and it's complementary to 92A. So um, we created a targeted delivery vehicle that basically looks like this. Uh, that is a PEG polylysine uh, block copolymer, like I showed you before, that complexes with this 92A inhibitor and makes spherical micelles, as the cryo TEM says, and on the periphery is a peptide that is a targeting agent for VCAM. So the idea is we can inject these things into the bloodstream and they will accumulate at the sites, sites of inflammation where VCAM receptors are. And we tried it out on mice that we essentially uh, gave atherosclerosis to. <laughs> mice don't get atherosclerosis. For one thing, it's a slow developing disease and the, the mice only live two years. Uh, but if you create a genetically modified uh, mouse that doesn't have what we sometimes call um, good cholesterol and you feed them that HFD is high fat diet, almost universally referred to in the literature as a Western diet, um, these mice get atherosclerosis in two months, something like that. So we take 16 week old genetically modified mice, feed them a high fat diet. After um, two weeks where that red arrow is, we inject a suspension of our mice cells. And then we sacrifice the animals after two more weeks and measure the size of the atherosclerotic plaques. Uh, and the four columns here are what happens if we just inject saline, phosphate buffered saline? What happens if we inject the naked inhibitor, meaning uh, that molecule in the, in the lower middle there all by itself, which works. It reduces the size of the plaques by about 50%. Um, the third column is a control. It's basically uh, a, a nucleic acid that has the same uh, basis, but not in the same order. And uh, then we do the thing that I was told you, that is we inject our engineered uh, micelles and you can see we get an 80% reduction. Uh, so these uh, actually work quite well. An even more dramatic thing is if we, um, uh, do a kind of, uh, uh, intervention on the animal where we do something called a partial cryotic, partial carotid ligation. We tie off the carotid artery that produces a disturbed blood flow. And the same kind of set of experiments produces um, the closing of the blood vessels downstream. And now you can see uh, that the same series of things, even the naked inhibitor, don't do much to keep the blood vessel open. Whereas uh, our delivery of this keeps the blood vessel open uh, to a large extent. So these things are useful. Uh, these thing, these kind of constructs are being used to deliver gene therapy and cancer uh, chemotherapy. I will point out that more people uh, in both North America and the rest of the world die of heart disease than of cancer. So uh, we're trying to bring some of the nano medicine to bear on heart disease. Okay, that's the last uh, of that. <laughs> um, the next thing we tried to do to understand the polymer physics of this better was to have another system where we could have an identical backbone, but either a positively charged uh, side chain or a negatively charged side chain with exactly the same backbone chains. 
And for that, we started using these uh, polymers in the upper left-hand corner, which are copolymers, random copolymers of um, polyethylene oxide and polyallyl glycidol ether. That's what AGE is. And the pendant double bond enables us to use thiol click chemistry, this SH group here, to attach either a, uh, an anionic group or a cation group. So we can start with exactly the same polymer and turn it into a cationic version or an anionic version, and then study how the systematic charge density variation works. And so we made polymers from 10% charged to 100% charged with this chemistry. And you can see that uh, they all form uh, uh, liquid liquid phase separated droplets all the except for the 10% one it didn't phase separate at all at this chain length of uh, 200 monomers uh, but it takes less and less salt to dissolve the two phase material when you have less and less charge uh, so, so this is what the uh, the phase diagrams look like now you see that there's a much bigger two phase region the higher the charge and then if you look at them individually uh, you'll notice that there are some positively sloped tie lines here. So my uh, intuition that that shouldn't happen is not true uh, for these lower charge density polymers uh, as you go from the higher charge density to the lower charge density in this system. In contrast to the data that I showed you before in the lower right, you can get um, uh, positively shaped tie lines, positively sloped tie lines. The other thing that we've done very recently, and this hasn't been published yet, uh, somewhat for Jean-Francois's benefit, uh, is to use this same chemistry to look at how, in a semi-dilute solution, um, positively and negatively charged blobs organize themselves. And the hypothesis has been that maybe there's an ordered structure, that positive and negatively charged blobs have some correlation between them. And uh, one might be able to detect that. Um, and um, I think I can skip that over. If you just looked at the scattering of all the polymers, you'd get a sort of normal Ornstein Zernica plot. But um, uh, if you could somehow make only the cationic polymers visible, as in a neutron scattering experiment, then you could look at the correlation length between only the uh, cationic uh, blobs. And we can do that. Uh, instead of using uh, just um, a, um, a hydrogenated polyethylene oxide in the lower uh, right, we use a deuterated polyethylene oxide. So we end up with a deuterated uh, polyanion, uh, sorry, deuterated polycation. And then we can do neutron scattering experiments. And what you see, even if you just do the direct scattering from the public cations, is a correlation peak that uh, indicates that there is a preferred length between the cationic blobs. And if you do some sub subtraction uh, of uh, the two uh, on the left, you can sort of look at the charge contrast. The exact position depends upon what concentration we had and stuff like that. But the fact that there is a peak there strongly supports this idea of correlation between the positioning of the positively and negatively charged blobs. The other thing that we can do with these uh, polymers of varying charge density is um, mix two forms of the polymer. So um, what I'm suggesting here is that we might mix, let's say the polymers in the second line, that is the the 30% charged with the 72% charged. And the interesting thing here is that they have very different critical salt concentrations and they have very different polymer concentrations and therefore they have different interfacial tensions. And so when you do that kind of mixing, you get things like this, I'm sorry, I'm hard time pushing, but you get things like this droplets within droplets. <laughs> Uh, and the lower interfacial tension droplet surrounds the higher interfacial tension droplet. And these are polymers that are very similar chemically, but there's enough difference in interfacial tension that they form multi-phase compartments. Um, that leads up to the sort of endpoint of the, what I wanted to say. It is um, 
in addition to all the uh, interest these days in biological condensates, mm -hmm. there's an historical interest uh, going back to, as it says, the 1920s. And Oparin and Haldane independently proposed that a protocell could be one of these uh, coacervate droplets. It, it doesn't take much to find a paper like this. Uh, what it takes is a lot to <laughs> discover where the uh, starting materials that would uh, make them come from. Uh, but, you know, people are still thinking about this. Um, one of the leading uh, scientists uh, uh, interested in, in these phenomena is Jack Sostak, who uh, is a Nobel Prize winner who received the Nobel Prize a while ago for the shortening of telomeres. Uh, when he was at Harvard, he's recently moved to Chicago. But back when he was at Har Harvard, he took issue with this idea that uh, 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 these uh, two-phase systems would be good protocells. And his reasoning for that is that he measured dye-labeled RNA exchange between these droplets. And he didn't feel that, that the high rate of exchange that he measured was consistent with the ability to actually segregate and develop biology inside these uh, compartments. And I think that's a, a, a reasonable experiment, but we've recently done something that um, uh, could conceivably revive this. I don't want to I don't want to push it too hard, but we've um, used the same system that, that Jack did. Uh, it's a, actually a ATP uh, poly um, cation uh, complex. So you mix these two together, like I've been talking about. You get complex droplets. As usual, they macroscopically phase separate and settle to the bottom. But if you now replace the supernatant with still water and shake them up again to make droplets out of them, those droplets do not coalesce anymore. They get some kind of skin on them because we've measured some things about the elastic properties that we think might come from some kind of peripheral um, ionic cross-linking near the interface with these things. Um, We've measured both uh, dye diffusion. Um, if you keep them in the supernatant and you, you start this with red and green droplets, the red droplets turn a little green and the green droplets turn a little red. But if you have them in DI water, like in the upper right, there's no dye exchange of, of this particular dye. Um, and we've measured by uh, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching that there's a liquid interior in both of these things. So you're not turning the whole thing into a solid ball. Uh, a little bit of delayed diffusion in uh, the FRAP experiment here, but not much. And recently, uh, in collaboration with Jack's lab, this is very hard to see. I, I was worried this wouldn't come out very well. But we do see um, uh, some size dependent RNA exchange uh, in these now DI water fixed things. So these things have this skin on them that I said, and we find that there is exchange of uh, six mer RNA and eight mer RNA, but 14 and above does not exchange. So it's possible that these things are capable of uh, encapsulating um, uh, nucleic acids in a way that would lend a little more credence to the idea of uh, polyelectrolyte complex droplets being related to the origin of life. I don't want to oversell it. The phenomena themselves are kind of interesting. And if you were you know, a, a practical polymer scientist, uh, this treatment with the eye water could be a different way of encapsulating something that might have some other practical uh, purpose. So I'm, I'm basically done. Um, the, the points I want to leave you with is that these things can make interesting materials that with properly chosen molecules, we can, I think, simplify and deepen our understanding of the polymer physics. One can use these things for self-assembly. And of course, uh, there's a lot of interest in how this, uh, these phenomena play out in biology. And uh, we hope to be able to contribute to that too.
So that's the end of what I had to say. The four people who contributed to this most have been uh, Angelica Neitzel, Jan Fang, Artem. Uh, oh, there's five people there. Wait a second. Yeah, five people there. Um, Alex Morris and uh, Zheng Zhao, who did all the biomedical things. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Congratulations, Claire. Interesting uh, presentation. So now we have time for questions. Yeah, in, in the beginning of your talk, when you were talking about conservation, there were always droplets and no microscopic phase. No, no, these There's things. Pictures, this drop is forming. No, the do, things do they that. Grain? Do they cause grain? with time? Or they do. And, do? you know, I mean, I could uh, go back. Um, I, I should have drawn attention to it, but in these first kind of pictures, these, see, these things settle into to macroscopic phases at the bottom because they're denser. Always. Uh, I wouldn't say always. Uh, the things I've talked about generally do. And how long does it take for them to make microscopic, microscopic <clears throat> It's not fast. It's not fast. Uh, I, I mean, that, that's, not, that's not an answer. No, it's probably not days. It's probably hours. Yeah. I want to come back to, to this argument of Ching and Wang. Um, so the, the entropy in water is, of course, also directly connected to the dielectric constant of water. Because yeah, that's what he tells me. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> that's directly related with local molecular rearrangement. And then when I go back to, I remember what we, what was was saying when I worked on on charge stabilized colloids. Uh, it was always said, okay, temperature is not a good variable for that because uh, the dielectric constant of water goes like T, and your uh, your temperature goes like uh, your, uh, your thermal energy goes like T. So if you change the temperature in a colloidal system, essentially nothing changes. Is, is that the same kind of argument as as uh, as Zheng and Wang makes? I, I'm not too capable of actually uh, reproducing his argument. It, it's not true that in in these systems we've studied these things at constant temperature and varied the salt. But um, you know, with systems very much like the ones I've showed you, uh, uh, for example, a group at NIST have kept the salt concentration constant and varied the temperature. These things often have lower critical solution temperatures. So, I, I mean, I don't know how that squares with your idea that uh, if you change the temperature, nothing happens. But I think what you're saying is similar to what Jen Gong is saying, but I couldn't really um, promote his argument very well. Okay, I have a question. I don't know who, which one of you. <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> your argument, and theoretically, you say that the actual concept of water goes like one over temperature. Laws. But if you do experiments, it's not quite true, I think. If you plot epsilon times T, yes, but, it varies with temperature. But, but not that much as one would expect. Uh, enough that you see it. <laughs> so, so then, I don't know. At some point, you mentioned that uh, uh, droplets with double strand DNA and single strand DNA <laughs> have different shape and then affect their circulation. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what do you mean by this? I mean, did you measure how they migrate uh, around tissues? We, we have to some extent. What I, what I mean, and I, I, I went through all of this pretty fast, but uh, to administer these things into the circulation of mice to treat some kind of condition in the cardiovascular system, we inject them in the tail vein of the mouse. So these things and then you flow through them the, across. Uh, well, we, we watch where they end up. Okay. Uh, so if you try to inject long worm-like micelles, they get filtered out in organs before they reach the heart. They get filtered out in the spleen and the liver and the kidneys and stuff like that. So shape really matters. It does, yeah. yeah. Is there any question? Go ahead. Go ahead. I had the curiosity because you, you showed these uh, droplets inside mm -hmm. droplets that was related to substantial. It was not very clear to me what type of system uh, you were pursuing, in particular how you were, how much it depended on how your ability to control or to determine the, the different. Yeah, I said to point out all of the information in there. First of all, if the degree of charge and therefore the interfacial tension um, 
was too similar. We didn't get that kind of thing. Um, the experiments I showed you and kind of the novelty of the experiments that I showed you is that they are done with materials that have different charge, but otherwise very similar kind of chemical constituents. People have observed droplets within droplets in, uh, in the polyelectrolyte complexation, but with very different materials. So sort of the, the simplicity here is that um, it's a little bit like the beginning of the story with trying to use the simplest possible polyelectrolytes. It's not a big chemical incompatibility that's causing this. It's just uh, something uh, that we attribute to the difference in interfacial tension. And, and we've measured the interfacial tension of polymers like this as you increase the salt. It's mostly really like controlling that. the contrast in, in salt. And yeah. 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 David Files, I'm sorry, at Harvard, spent a lot of work with Who? David Files. Oh, yeah, He's sure. Microfluidic. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. Kurt, you have a comment? I had a very simple question just to get the numbers straight for myself. So when, when you look at the DNA, uh, I have the impression that you're very close to the typical demanding condensation uh, for all your systems. Uh, when, when we look at what did you say? And when you look at the DNA, if the double strand oh. DNA compared to the single yeah. strand, it's yeah. somewhere around. Right. Right. So the so demanding parameter is four. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. I think we're either close or above. Yeah. There is a question from uh, yeah. one more question from Ben Schuller. Thanks you for a great talk. And Ben asks, do you have a physical intuition for why the slope of the tie lines depends on the charge density of the polymer? You know, I, I honestly am not sure. I mean, well, I guess it does in that one system. I, I wouldn't want to. I think I said it in a way that I think that's general, and I don't necessarily think that's general. Um, I, I probably ought to just say no, because I don't really. Um, I think um, the, um, I, I think the, um, terms that might affect the, the correlations among the, uh, among the polymer chains become less and less important. So if it has something to do with excluded volume or something like that, those effects that might kind of squeeze salt out of the dense phase are less important. Because in our first paper where we made a big point that uh, the tie lines were negative, uh, Juan de Pablo did some simulations of these things where he sort of uh, tuned the excluded volume parameter and uh, increasing the excluded volume sort of drove salt out of the dense phase. So it probably has something to do with that. But I, I wish I had never said it in the first place. <laughs> I'd like to say so. <laughs> okay. Any additional question? Yes, Hans. I was wondering if you had the uh, uh, DNS water, you saw that the stroke is sort of remains stable. Uh, is it complex because it's. Did you also mention where they still have a residual charge of these drops or are they completely neutral? Yeah, they're, they're charged. And if you look at that paper, a big other portion of the paper, which didn't have much to do with what I was talking about today, looked at their electrochromatic fluoretic mobility and things like that. They're, they're definitely charged. So even an alternative explanation for why they don't uh, coalesce could have to do with charge repulsion in, in, instead of, uh, I, I bet there is some kind of elastic skin because there's not so much interdiffusion, but, but uh, it, the, the main reason for non-coalescence still could have a lot to do with charge. Okay, so let's uh, thank Matthew again. Thanks. It brings us to the end of this uh, event. I, I hope you have enjoyed the uh, award ceremony and uh, this uh, interesting scientific symposium. Thank you to the speakers. So thank you to all of you for, for making it lively. And um, I hope we will meet, I don't know, in three years time, it will be a new occasion for another Bernie on the prize and we'll see what, what happens and where we are. So thank you very much again to all of you here and also the people that are attending remotely. Yeah.